Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Long and Winding Royal Road. This is episode four, and uh, my name is W.H. Park. Of course, I'm the co-host of the Post Perez uh, monthly show with John Pollock here at postwrestling.com. And uh, I might have said before on a previous episode of uh, the Long and Winding Royal Road that every fourth episode of this uh, series will cover a particular person from the roster of All Japan Pro Wrestling from the 90s. Uh, you know, we, I, I picked the fourth episode because, you know, like the, the main uh, inventors of the, of the time were called the Four Pillars of Heaven. And so we're going to do every fourth episode. So episode four, episode eight, 12, 16, and so forth, and so on. And, and to kick things off with these profile episodes, who better than to talk about <laughs> Mitsuharu Misawa and, and, of course, the, the ace of all Japan Pro Wrestling of the 90s. And who better to help me talk about Misahara Misawa than, in my estimation, one of the uh, premier authorities of Misawa and, and his company that he found after he left all Japan Pro Wrestling, and that's uh, Pro Wrestling Noah. And that's uh, Hisami over at, uh, on Twitter. It's uh, at Hisami. It's a very interesting way to spell it. It's at H-I-5-A-M-E. Uh, uh, and, of course, she also has a blog that you can... Find all the information you need about Pro Wrestling Noah. If you want to know, what, what did they say? What did Keno yell this time? What did those guys in the Rattel say this time? Well, she'll translate all that stuff for you <laughs> if you really want to know. I personally don't always necessarily want to know what Keno has to say or is, is yelling or, or what the Rattels have to say. But if, if I want to know what Katsuhiko Nakajima and Go Shizaki are, are beefing over these days, I'll go over to her blog. And that's at uh, proprogramtranslations.com blogspot.co.uk and then we'll we'll get Hisami to um uh give give us some plugs after the at the end of the show as well but Hisami how are you today yeah I'm not too bad not too bad it's a nice bright September day so how have you been I'm good uh it's uh it's, a, it's it's still very hot and humid here in Japan but yeah. uh, I'm I'm hoping uh, you know typhoon season's around the corner. I was about to say you've got the rainy season rolling in. Yeah, yeah. but that always like comes with the uh, with the promise of like uh, cooler weather, and yeah. uh, and I don't have to keep my air conditioner on all the time to to, to stay comfortable. <laughs> so yeah, so you are uh, like I said, uh, an authority on pro wrestling. No, in Thank like you. the Thank English. In the English speaking uh, wrestling fandom, pro res fandom, like I've discovered you th- on Twitter. And of course, I listened to a great episode you did with my friend Dylan uh, Fox yeah. over at the Eastern Lair. You did a primer about pro wrestling Noah. And I urge people to go check that out, as well as like a, a primer, a kind of a, a small, like a, a shorter version of that kind of a style of a show that John Pollock and I did about Noah a couple of months ago at Post Perez. You can check that out at the feed at postwrestling.com but my question for you like to start off the ba- right like to start off this episode is what got you into professional wrestling and what got you into loving pro wrestling noah so much um well i actually got into um pro wrestling when i was about when i was a child i must have been about nine or ten years old and it was actually through um wwf uh, as it was known at the time uh, my brother uh, my younger brother had some trading cards and he bought them back and there's even a kind of a picture of that moment um, of us sitting on a train together and we're, we're looking at them um, but I got into wrestling itself um, that way um, pro wrestling Noah actually came a few years later um, when my boyfriend um, said to me that I might like Japanese wrestling and he brought home um, some tapes that he'd, he'd you know in those days it was VHS trading it was the, the early 2000s and one of the tapes um, was pro wrestling Noah and you had with it um, All Japan, New Japan, Dragon Gate. Um, but it was just Noah that I loved um, the, the most of all, all of it. What, what, what was it about like Noah itself that attracted you more than the other companies on, the, on those um, tapes? Yeah, um, looking back on it, um, I think it must have been just, just it was so different from all the others. Um, I mean, New Japan, you know, you had the, the big production. Um, all Japan, um, it interested me, but not as much. Noah seemed to be just a lot smaller, a lot more intimate, and I think that is what that's what that's what appealed appealed to me. So, who caught your eye on the Noah roster at that time when you were really getting like first starting getting into it? 
Um, I think it was must have been the junior division. Um, I remember just being just really like just fascinated by them, and I loved the veterans, and I just loved just the way the whole thing was just just laid out. I don't remember exactly who it was um, in particular, um, but I do remember it must have been just a fast pace of the the juniors to begin with, because I've always been fond of the the junior the junior division and how you've got the kind of like the the big divide in those days um, before it really started to change. Um, between the juniors and the heavyweights, but I do remember that. And then, the and then that would expand to like, um, you know, by my estimation, like from reading your Twitter and like your other work on your blog, is that you become so knowledgeable about like the entire history of the company and and different yes. members of the roster. So, yes. and, and so that's why you know I'm inviting you to do this this piece on this profile piece on Mitsuhara Masawa because obviously you know a lot about uh, his life. I've read some of your work about, it and it's I learned so many mm-hmm. things about Misawa that I didn't know before. I was like, wow, I have to have Hisami on this show to talk about Misawa. <laughs> but what what is it about, let's get, before we get into kind of like his life, um, let, let me ask you, like, what is it about Misawa that you find captivating? Um, I find him captivating the fact that he wasn't somebody that, you know, you'd look at and you'd think, oh my gosh, you know, he's got the looks or, or anything like that. What he had um, was what Barbara was always looking for. And it was the presence. Um, it was what he, you know, he could do. He was a uh, inventor. He was inventive. Um, for example, um, before Misawa, nobody had actually utilised the elbow in the way that he did. Um, the suplex people had done it, but they didn't, you know, they didn't make it as he did. Um, it was the fact that he was inventive, and you know, he was. And he, I think, he was also as well somebody rather than who you know, be threatened by what was out there, be threatened by change, be threatened by another company. He was actually somebody who saw more, in a way, of helping them. Um, he was a fascinating person because there were so many different sides different sides of him. Um, and I, that's what really fascinated me, you know, his his sad childhood, you know, his, you know, his, his love for animals, you know, his, you know, the way that the roster saw him as a father, how he was a businessman. It's, there was a lot of aspects of Misawa, which were, which were so interesting, which so, is what I find. So your, your exposure to him and Noah, did that inspire you to like go back and check out his stuff, you know, pre Noah, which would be of course in all Japan pro wrestling. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think it was again, um, my boyfriend, cause he got me like loads of like, um, discs and, and, you know, and later, um, VHS and DVDs of it as well um, and I remember looking up um, some of his old Japan matches and just reading you know some of the most vicious elbows you've ever seen in wrestling I thought yeah that is something I really really must see and from then on I was kind of um, I mean I'm someone who loves history anyway um, so now I was kind of hooked in discovering you know the history of you know that era of all Japan you know, Barber's history, and I'm even, you know, thinking about looking into doing some more on um, Ricky Dozan, um, because he being the father of Japanese wrestling, um, I think, you know, his contribution, what he gave, what he did, um, I think that gets lost as well. Um, but yeah, I thought, you know, I really must know more about Misawa's time in the Lord Japan, because I feel like I'm I'm skipping a chapter otherwise. Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a great story. I mean, for my, my own self, like, I remember when I first got into you know, tape trading back in the, uh, the late nineties. And I got this tape that was like a mix of, uh, primarily like new Japan and some, um, and it was was like new Japan and all Japan and like some Michinoku pro, but I was like the first time I like really saw anything from all Japan. And I was like, Oh, like these guys are wearing like really funky colored tights. Like Masawa had the the green and the silver (laughs) and Kawada was black and yellow. Kobashi was you know, orange, Akiyama yeah. was blue, Tawe was red. And, and Masawa kind of like, you know, really sparked my interest at yeah. when I first saw him. Cause see, I think he was the most colorful, like yeah. with his tights and like the way he wrestled and stuff like that. And I think yeah. the first match I ever saw him was, uh, well, was a match we'll probably mention like as we go through his life and, and his career is, is the match where he debuted the, uh, the tiger driver in 91. <laughs> yeah. uh, like, was that again? That, that was against Tawe, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. I, I believe it was. Yeah, and I remember vividly seeing that, like, just jumping off my couch. Yeah, I thought, I just... oh my god, he has killed the Kiritawe. <laughs> yeah. But Kiritawe's still alive, and I'm like, how did he survive that? That, 
that's crazy. And then you just get deeper into these matches, and then you like you know you see the matches like Kobashi has with Doctor Dusty Williams, where he's getting backdrop suplex onto yeah. his head, and I'm just like, ah, uh, you know, it's, you just yeah. how they just survived because all, all Japan in those days it wasn't it wasn't a, a what's the word? It wasn't just a fight; it was a war. I mean, those guys just rode shotgun. They it was just it's just mind blowing what they did. Oh yeah, I, I I can't believe like some of these guys like were able to continue like after another yeah. ten fifteen years after this. Obviously, like it took its toll on all of their bodies. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, beyond that, like as I continue watching, like I can become deeply fascinated by this rivalry between Misawa and Toshiaki Kawada because like yeah. of of all the great matches he's having with Tawe, with Stan Hansen, with. Ken Kobashi and and Akiyama and all these other people in these various tags, there is a certain intensity that that is unmatched when he's in there with Kawada. Yeah. Oh yeah. That was just I mean, even the ref used to have to get like legitimately between them to separate them, to prevent them from killing each other. Um because I mean Kawada, um, as we know, he had that notoriously short temper. And Misawa, he used to provoke him. And you always knew when Kawada was about to lose his temper because there was just like this split second where he just used to go just really still and then he'd snap. And <laughs> and then it was, you know, it was on as it never was before. But the ref used to have to get between them and just sometimes just legitimately separate them because Misawa used to just poke him too far. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of like, for, for me, like, I, I love all these guys, you know, but for me, my favorite member of the Four Pillars has always been Kawada, just because I, I find his story a little bit more fascinating than the other three. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. it's that that's quality you're talking about, like, that there's that, you know, that legit intensity that he has in his yeah. matches with, with everyone, especially with Masao, but just even with yeah. Kobashi, and then he's... You know, early on, his feud with Akira Tawe, when they were on opposite sides, he, you know, Tawe's in Surigan and, and Kawada's still a member of Super Generation Army. But, yeah. you know, but we're not here to talk about Kawada. We're you're getting off track already. Sorry about that. <laughs> we're here to talk about, about Mitsuhara Masawa. And, and let, let's get into it. Um, I'm just going to start off with saying, like, you know, um, first of all, we got to talk about he was born in Yubari, Hokkaido. Uh, but yeah. early on, his family moved to a place called Koshigaya in Saitama. Uh, yeah. That was because I think the coal mine where his father had worked was, yes. uh, started to his, decline and his, close down. Yeah, yeah. Um, Isawa doesn't actually um, really had doesn't didn't really have many memories of Hokkaido growing up um, because his family had left a few months after he'd been born. Um, but nevertheless, he seemed to have always been very fond of the place um, because he take Noah up there, and you know he used to take um, you know some of the roster to his favorite. Um, you know his favorite restaurant and years later um when marafuji went back um they showed him that you know the restaurant was still there and you know misawa still had his favorite seat and even touching me um during their all japan years um when it was the anniversary of his death uh shiozaki and uh kotaro suzuki they actually visited um, misawa's favorite restaurant and they they laid out a place for him they put out his favorite drink and his um his cigarettes um, so even though he didn't remember it, um, Misawa was still fond of of Hokkaido. Uh, like, that's a really great story about like Shizaki and Kotaro Suzuki yeah. going to his favorite restaurant. Um, he had a very like troubled childhood. He did. Um, his father was a drunk, and um, the main targets of um, you know, that, say for example, his violence was um, was his wife and his um, second son, which Misawa. Um, it is believed um, that Misawa actually had an older brother, um, but his father, for some reason, preferred the older brother to the younger one. And um, his mother used to get the worst of um, his father's drunken rage. And so what she used to do um, is that when things got too bad, um, she used to keep like um, blankets and, you know, shoes and a change of clothes um, in bags. And she'd um, run away to the park with her children that's that's a uh, really, uh, really yeah, uh, harrowing uh, to listen to, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, um, one point things got so bad um, that he actually attacked her with a knife. Um, and um, obviously, you know, um, after a while they they divorced. I think Misawa must have been about eight years old or so when his father finally vanished from his life and he never had anything to do with him after that. 
Um, but he, there was a time when he was in training and um, he was actually in tears. And they asked him what was wrong. And he said that I just, I'm just reminded of my mother. Because obviously, you know, everyone's hitting each other. They're fighting each other. Um, but I think when he first started training, he, he found, you know, this resurrection of the memories of this terrible childhood he'd had. Um, very hard to, to deal with it at times. Well, well, he got into training because, like, I guess one of the things he found solace in was professional wrestling, especially, you know, the uh, All Japan Pro Wrestling. Uh, and, yeah. like, and he, I read that his fav- first favorite wrestler was a man by the name of Horst Hoffman. Yes, Horst Hoffman um, had been a German wrestler and he'd been active in Japan. And Misawa was really taken with him and hence the reason um, for, um, for the green, um, which he used in um, Horseman's, Horseman's Honor. And so, like, he would, uh, and of course he would later incorporate these colors in his own promotion in Pro Wrestling yes. Noah. Um, he, he, he wanted to start, you know, training as a wrestler from the, like, he wanted to become a, a wrestler from the age of 12, but, and he wanted to go straight into it. But, like, his, his mother and, and some of his teachers said, no, you got to finish school first. You got to, you got to go into, yes. get, go into college yeah. first. Yeah, and he was also told that by Jumba Saruta as well, um, because when we saw was part of the wrestling club um, at high school, um, he actually went to All Japan. Uh, Saruta answered the door and said to him, "No, you know, you're not. You're going to have to graduate before before you come back." Um, but yeah, uh, but which was which was um, different to let's say, for example, a Gawa story, because a was a high school dropout, um, but Barbara accepted him. Um, but with Misawa, no, he was told you need to graduate and then you know and then come back and it's at uh, the ashikaga institute of technology in tochiki that he would attend high school there on a scholarship but he would also meet someone very important to him and that would be one toshiaki kawada yeah kawada was actually a year younger um the misawa and he actually joined um on misawa's um you know invite um or japan a, a year later it could have been very different for Kawada um, because he almost joined New Japan. Um, but no, it was Misawa who said to him to come to, to All Japan. And yeah, and they went to all sorts of, uh, you know, you know, places together in their time in, in high school. They went overseas. Um, but, you know, despite all that, it was actually a very, very tough life being part of the wrestling club. Because the only days they ever got off, and we're talking about a whole year here, um, it was New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. And that was it. On the rest of the year, they trained nonstop. They only had two days off in 365. Wow, that's that's pretty that's pretty hardcore. Yeah. Um, but Masao found some success as a as a high school wrestler. He did. He did. Um, I think um, it's a case where he actually won. Um, but I know that he did win some very prestigious awards. Um, I know that he won like a, a national award or. Or something, and I think he was almost chosen for um, for the Olympics. So he he wrestled at 187 pounds, and he won the yeah. national high school championship in 1980. That's it. Yeah, and yeah. same year he placed fifth at the freestyle world championships, uh, competing in the junior age group. So like you know he he was good at it, but apparently he he wasn't really a fan of amateur wrestling. No, um, part of the reason why he actually got into wrestling in the first place um, was because he found that um, it was, you know, better to, to do it um, than to watch it. It was more fun. And and also the other reason was that it went back to his father, um, because if he felt that, you know, if he was if he was big, if he was muscled, um, then nobody ever again um, was going to try and attack him. Yeah, so... From high school, he, he would enter the uh, All Japan Pro Wrestling Dojo uh, in March of 1981, and he was trained mainly by Kazuharu Sonoda and Akihisa Takechiho, also known as, each, respectively, the Magic Dragon and the Great yep. Kabuki, which I, I think is really interesting that like he was trained by one of the, his main trainers was the Great Kabuki. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he would also receive some training from... Uh, uh, the Destroyer, Dick Bear, Shohei Baba, of course, uh, Dory Funk Jr., and and eventually even the, the legendary Lou Fez. So he he had a really you know very solid foundation to work from. Yeah, uh, uh, Baba um, wasn't really interested in wrestlers who could only show him how well they could throw a punch or how well they could you know um, let's say you know suplex an opponent and whatever. What Baba wanted um, was wrestlers who could take a move. 
And he was very particular about it because until you could actually do this to your satisfaction and until you actually made, you know, what could best be approximated as the sound, um, he wouldn't let you he wouldn't let you debut. Um, it's always said that um, there's a story that goes that Barbara was backstage and he was talking to somebody and he stopped and he listened to what was going on in the ring. And he said, ah, he said, it's Misawa because, you know, there's this very certain sound, this very certain way they took the ropes, this very certain way that they fell. Um, Barbara knew who was in the ring. It's kind of a nuance that Tenru um, heard the, also that when he went to, to Noah. Um, but that was the way that, you know, Barbara, Barbara was very strict about, you know, you have to do it this way. You have to do the sound that I want. Otherwise, you know, forget it. I want you to be able to receive, not just take. So at some point, like, you know, like uh, by August of the same uh, by August of the same year, like Baba must have been satisfied with the sounds that Masao was making. Yeah. So he, yeah. he debuted August 21st, 1981 in, in the match against uh, Shiro Koshinaka. May, maybe many people know as the master and inventor of the hip attack. Uh, and like uh, he lost in this match against Koshinaka. It was at an outdoor show in Uruwa. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I live in Japan. I sometimes can't pronounce places in Japan. It's, it's a little <laughs> embarrassing. But uh, that's, uh, you know, that he made his debut. He lost, as most, you know, young boys in, in professional wrestling in Japan tend to do. They tend to, tend to lose, like, not only their first match, Sami, they tend to lose a lot of their matches when they start out. They do. Um, in a way, it's kind of mirroring um, mirroring uh, Geisha. Uh, because Geisha, when they're Maiko, um, they start off, and they're, you know, the trainees, they start off by... <laughs> You know, always attending, let's say, parties with their older, you know, with their older sisters, with their, the seniors. They start off by watching them. They don't actually do anything by themselves um, for a while. It's kind of the same um, in in wrestling in a way, in that the trainees, they will always lose their first match. They will always wait at ringside. You know, they will always have, you know, these matches, tag matches, where usually they are the ones that take the fall. Um, before they're actually judged to be able to be start branching off um, by themselves. It's uh, learning by observation, and Misawa's was no different, although his debut was actually the short, you know, one of the shortest times um, from, you know, entry to, to actually, you know, getting in the ring. Yeah, and he, he wouldn't have to, like, you know, go for years on years losing anything. Uh, he, would no, get his, no. he would get his first win on October 9th in a tag match yeah. with... Uh, Teaming with Mitsuo Momoda, one of the sons of uh, Riki Dozan, and they were facing the team of Hiromichi Fuyuki, who would later join Tenru over in SWS and War and move on to FMW. And he and uh, Fuyuki was teaming with Nobuyoshi Sugawara, and uh, and they won that tag match. And then Masao would actually get his first singles match uh, uh, win against Sugawara a couple of nights, several nights later. Yes, yeah, uh, it's a big moment to watch. It's not. It's not easy to find, but if you can find clips, um, I kind of call it the blooming. It's kind of when, you know, Misawa really started to find his feet and perhaps to, you know, to take off. And I think he also then kind of gained an awareness. Um, and I think so did Baba um, about who he was and where, you know, where he was going and what he was going to become. Um, because as time, you know, progressed... Um, we'll, we'll get to the Baba Misawa story later. It's not the not really the place for it well, well, just now. Based on your research, did you think did the fans take the Masao right away? Um, they did, and they didn't. I think they were interested to see what he'd become, uh, but I also think that they were kind of thought, okay, we know let's let him get a bit more momentum because there's other guys here, older guys on the roster, and we'll see see how it goes. But they were certainly interested in him, especially because you know he had the. The shortest time from debut, you know, from um, entry to to debut. So he was, you know, he was a let's say he was a, a heating up prospect. Yeah, and from from here we get to uh, April of 1983, and this is kind of like the next phase of Masao's career. He he would enter a tournament called the Luthez Cup. Yes. And he would reach the finals, and and let's talk about like the the, the reward for the winner of the uh, Luthez Cup here. I think for Misawa, um, it put him on another level and it put him on the next level that he needed to go. Um, I don't think for him that competing in the tournament would just have been enough. Um, he needed to win it. And I think also by this time um, in all Japan, Barba was starting to slow down. Um, and I think he was also becoming aware that he himself um, was, you know, I think he was starting to feel the first effects um, of perhaps his illness. 
and I think behind the scenes in all Japan, um, it was a time when, you know, Misawa started also to gain prominence. Um, but, you know, for him, winning that cup was something that needed to happen. Otherwise, I don't think people, things would have turned out the way it the way it would have done. He, he would make the finals against uh, Koshinaka, and they ha- would have their match in uh, on April 22nd in the Nakajima Sports Center. And uh, the finals were re- re- refereed by Luthez himself, which is pretty cool. And then uh, he he lost the match, but you know apparently Baba like loved what he saw from both, and especially from Masao. So he said, "Okay, I'm going to send both these guys, and uh, they're both going to get the prize, which is an excursion to go to Mexico." Yeah, um, he went off with, I think, uh, Shiro Koshinaka um, also joined them. Um, but I do remember that their time in Mexico, it, it was interesting, but I think it was quite difficult for them both. Um, but Misawa relished in, in all of that. But then, you know, he was told by Baba, well, you have to come home because I want to make you Tiger Mask. And Misawa thought, well, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to be Tiger Mask. I don't want to come home. Um, because contrary to, you know, what was... You know, what was said, what was always thought, Misawa did not like being Tiger Mask at all. No, that's definitely, like, something you you kind of... I, I feel watching him as Tiger Mask, like, you, I feel like I, I can see his discomfort being that character. But I, I do have to make one note, like, Misawa and Koshinaka, they, they wrestle for uh, EMML or CMML. I'm not sure which one. Like, I think they're they're intertwined. I'm not a lucha expert. Sorry, everyone who is a lucha expert is screaming at me right now. But they, they had the, the creative names of... Uh, you know, Samurai Shiro and Kamikaze Misawa. <laughs> and I'm just like, yeah, okay, it's the, the 80s. It's in Mexico. Yeah, well, yeah. It's, you, it's, you, it's, you it's, it's, it's no worse like than them going to Canada or the United States and getting something as stereotypical as that either. So yeah. uh, he, he, he did a lot of um, like apprenticeship, it seems, under a, a luchador by the name of La Fiera. If you know yeah, it, uh, yeah. Um, and his time in Mexico is still something that I need to, um, you know, discover, a, um, read a bit more about. Um, but I do know that, you know, for Misawa, this actually gave him, um, you know, a, a big view of the world, a big view of wrestling. And the fact that there was more to it outside of just all Japan or outside of Japan. Um, because in those days, um, and I guess it was very much the same in the States as well, um, you know, companies they didn't associate with other companies. You know, you would, it was very, you know, you just, you went to award shows, you weren't allowed to speak to anybody. Um, You know, working for one company could completely ruin your chances with the next. And that was going to be something that actually was, uh, you know, went on into actually the early 2000s even. Um, For Misawa, I think that gave him a view of thinking that, well, you know, if it's ever me that's ever in control, you know, this is what I'm going to do. Things can be very different. And that was good because it gave him a more of a world view than the the insular one that he'd he'd known in the confines of of all Japan. I found a great quote where you know, like you, you touched upon it that you know Baba called Masao back early from Mexico. He asked him if can you jump from the corner post, and then when Masao replied that he could, then he said, "Okay, come back," because that's of course the the way. Tiger Mask yeah. makes his entrance. Yeah. If you can do that, if you can do the entrance, you're going to be the new Tiger Mask. So um, from from here, like in, into the spring of 1990, Masao wrestles as the second incarnation of Tiger Mask following the, the pioneer of, of that gimmick, uh, Satoru Sayama, because Giant Baba had purchased the rights to the character from the mangaka Iki Kawa, uh, Kajiwara. Uh, so he, he had licensed the rights to, to New Japan for a while with Sayama under the gimmick, and then Baba bought the rights from him. Uh, is, apparently, Baba was actually a character in the original manga. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Baba uh, did a lot of stuff like that. <laughs> He's very His image is very popular here in Japan. Like, if you go to, like, kind of like, a, I don't know, like, retro shops or something like that you can see like you know and Anoki's a lot of places too stan hansen's a lot, on a lot of things but also baba i think people thought baba had a more like a uh, cuter image which is you know you know kawaii yeah. culture is very big in japan has always yeah. has been and you know you know baba's image is a lot more cuter than maybe like his his cartoon image at least is much more cuter than than antonio Anoki's. yes <laughs> Yeah, you can always find a lot of barber things, you know. The, I think they, they they left him because he was kind of like, you know, what they saw as the gentle giant. So how would how would you th- describe like you know you, we talked about 
that he wasn't comfortable being Tiger Mask too. He didn't really like the gimmick. But did the fans take to it? Did they enjoy him being Tiger Mask? Well, the fact is that no one actually knew it was Misawa. Um, I know it's um, very hard for you know us to perhaps even if we grew up in the '90s and you know born in the '80s, but for for anybody who was perhaps born you know later than um, you know late late '90s, early 2000s, um, it was a completely different world back then. There was no you know internet on phones. Um, you know we didn't have you know you know you wanted to make a phone call if you were outside you'd find a phone box we didn't have the range of information or social media that we have today. So nobody actually knew it, it was Misawa. People guessed because they thought, well, that looks like perhaps, you know, his his eyes. But until he unmasked, nobody knew. They just fell in love with Tiger Mask. Um, Misawa himself, as I've said, hated the gimmick um, because he couldn't really see in the mask. Um, it prevented him, you know, it made it difficult for him to do the moves that he'd want to do. And he used to complain to Baba, you know, how long do I have to do this? You know, Baba would be like, shh, you know, you know, just tell him to, you know, put up with it. Um, but no, Tiger Mask was not something that Misawa, Misawa enjoyed. Maybe he shouldn't have said anything. Maybe Baba would have let him take the mask off sooner. Maybe every time Misawa asked, Baba thought, six more months. You're yeah. Going to be Tiger Mask six more months. <laughs> but uh, Baba was definitely behind this. He would bring a lot of talent to face Masawa as Tiger Mask. He would yeah. bring people from Mexico, like the aforementioned La Fiera, also uh, luchadors like Jerry Estrada and Parada Morgan. But he would also yeah. like poach wrestlers from, from New Japan, uh, notably Dynamite Kid and Kuniaki yep. Kobayashi, who were famous for feuding with Sayama as Tiger Mask. Uh, the thing with Dynamite Kid, he never really had. Like those series of matches with Misawa as Tiger Mask because of his, you know, his schedule with the WWF at the time didn't really allow him to go back to All Japan uh, oh. enough to really f- um, have the feud with him. But uh, Kuniaki Kobayashi, on the other hand, had a great feud with Misawa as Tiger Mask. They they would have uh, a great match on June 21st. Uh, he, you know, Misawa would challenge for Kobayashi's NWA International Junior Heavyweight Championship match, uh, Heavyweight Championship. And, and that match was voted the best of the year by the, the by the readers of the Wrestling Observer newsletter. So Kobayashi, Kobayashi is kind of like the, the first guy to kind of like take Misawa to another level where he's getting a lot of notice as Tiger Mask. Um, um, as much as he hated the gimmick, um, for Misawa, it was a very good learning curve um, because it meant that although you know he wasn't this mask, it wasn't him. It meant perhaps he got to do the things that he would, you know, perhaps he wouldn't have done um, if, you know, if he wasn't, you know, if he didn't have the mask. Um, so I always look at Tiger Mask in that way. Yes, he hated it, but sometimes what you hate is good for you, and that was, I think, a very, very good, um, you know, apt in this situation because it gave him all those things under this character that perhaps Baba would never have thought of for, for Misawa. Uh, their feud, uh, the Tiger Mask Kobayashi feud, would culminate on August 31st when Masano would finally win the junior title from Kobayashi uh, and he would win with uh, one of his signature moves that he debuted in this match, the Tiger Suplex 85. Yeah. Um, no one had actually ever used um, suplexes in the way before um, Misawa did. Um, people just threw them, that was it. Um, they didn't do them repeatedly and they certainly didn't ever try um, normally to incorporate them into a pin. And it was the same with the rolling elbow. Um, people just used it. It was Misawa who actually put the finer points on it and, um, and, turned, it into, and turned it into a move. So uh, after winning the title, he would have a successful defense against uh, Chavo Guerrero Sr. And, on October 28th. And from there, Baba decided, okay, you're, you're not going to be a junior anymore. You're going to move into the heavyweight class. A lot of, lot, for, for a variety of reasons, but mainly because like he was having knee problems because of the, the, the offense he used as Tiger Mask. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was the thing about All Japan in that era – um, was that one thing that Baba wanted to get the impression was was that his wrestlers were monsters, and monsters they didn't wear knee pads because everyone it, it's like the kid at school wearing braces. So you're wearing braces, you're uncool. Um, he didn't like them to wear knee pads. The veterans didn't really approve of it, and there was a, you know, and he didn't like them either if they were injured to admit they were injured or ever really go to hospital. Um, Kabashi remembers after. Um, you know, getting, um, you know, almost whipped to death by Hanson and his bones showing through his arm, um, you know, finding Barbara in the lobby waiting for him and, you know, a, 
apologising for it. Barbara understood, um, but it was one thing that he didn't want. And I think that because of that, there was a lot of unnecessary accumulation that built that built up in their bodies, because he wanted this image that his wrestlers were indestructible. So of course, Misawa um, started developing knee problems, um, and so what happened was that you know Barbara decided, well, okay, well I'm going to move you up to to the heavyweights now. Um, but like Marafuji said, Misawa had loved loved being a junior, and he certainly did keep a lot of the elements of that um, when he turned heavyweight into his wrestling. So at this point, like uh, you know, like Misawa as Tiger Mask would be paired with Baba, and uh, they would go on a bit of a mini excursion because uh, on April nineteenth, nineteen eighty six, uh, they would enter the the NWA's Crockett Cup tag team tournament and uh they would which was held at the louisiana superdome and they reached the quarterfinals where they lost to the eventual second place team of ronnie garvin and magnum ta and i remember reading about this tournament in one of the the, the after mags in pro wrestling illustrated i think and i cannot for the life of me remember Vafa and tiger mask being in this tournament but then i, I wasn't really interested in in Japanese wrestling at the time, it was like, ooh, the Road Warriors, cool. <laughs> oh, look, it's Tully and Arn, or, or I think it was Tully Blanchard and Lex Luger. But now I have to go find that 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 magazine and, and, and look for those pictures again, or or look for it, this match. I think it might be on the WWE Network. I can go check there. Yeah. But uh, the next day, um, Misawa was then taken to the American Wrestling Association to their Wrestle Rock 86 event by by Stan Hansen and he would uh take on uh Buck Zumhoff where he would lose that match but I just think it's just a nice little aside of his career that he got to do some wrestling in America. Yeah, and also I think it was helped um you know because he was a a mass wrestler and he had a gimmick. Um and of course at that time we all know it was the golden age of gimmick wrestlers. Um so again, you know, it's the case of the mask, you know, as much as he hated it really did boost his career some other asides uh, interesting notes in 1986 uh, Masao would continue his association with Baba as a as a tag team and they would enter the uh, the world's strongest tag De- determination league it's a lot easier saying the real world tag league now these days <laughs> I mean can I just say that I'm glad we don't yeah. have to call it the world's strongest tag determination league by the way that's going to be WSTDL from the rest of the show, just so everyone knows that. Uh, they, they they would do okay. They would tie for sixth place. Um, but in, in the March of that year, Masawa would have a match against uh, the NWA champion at the time, Ric Flair, his only match with Flair. Um, and then he would transition from being Baba's partner into Jumbo Saruta's partner, the man who told him, finish school first, and then you can join the All Japan Dojo and become a wrestler. Uh, this is during a time when like Saruta had started feuding with his former tag team partner, Jinichiro Tenru. And this was like the main uh, feud at the time in the company. It was like Tenru's revolution stable taking on, you know, I guess an early version of Suruta Gun, though it wasn't called that at the time. Yeah, uh, Suruta, um, with, uh, he was kind of like uh, with Baba. He was like, you know, the, the seniors. So it was kind of like the logical next step for Misawa to take. He learned from Baba, he teamed with Baba. Um, Baba, um, of course, you know, was taking a, a back seat now to his his growing stars. Um, so Saruta was was the logical next step for for Misawa to, to team with, especially now as he was becoming, you know, more of a established established heavyweight. What I think is interesting about that that transition is also like you create this really clear lineage of Baba to Jumbo to yeah. Misawa. And it's, it's interesting because you can parallel that with like with Tenru and Kawada. And so like yeah. the rivalry of Jumbo and, and, and Tenru is kind of mirrored in their, you know, their apprentices in Misawa yeah. and Kawada later on. Yeah. It's funny how wrestling's always like that. You've got like this, this lineage um, if you know, you've got the you know the master pupil, the master pupil, the master pupil, and they kind of like you know correspond with each other, and they they feel down down the years. Um, it was it's interesting that that dynamic. Uh, on July third, uh, Misawa and Jumbo would win the PWF World Tag Team Championship from uh, the team of Ted DiBiase and Stan Hansen by countout, which you know that's back then like you could win titles on countouts and they would only hold those belts for eight days before dropping them back to uh dibiase and hansen uh but masao would get one of his biggest singles career that at that point in his career uh by pinning 
Ted DiBiase, Ted DiBiase on July 19th. And uh, I, I, it really goes to show you, like, like you know, like DiBiase is one of the, you know, kind of a big star from America of wrestling in all Japan. He's the perennial tag partner of Hanson for the time that he's there. So for Wasawa to kind of like this early in his career to get this pinfall over a notable Gaijin is, is pretty, is, is pretty like, you know, kind of a stamp of approval from Baba, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah, Baba. Um, What's the word I'm looking for now? It's it's completely gone out of out of my head. Uh, Baba um, by this time was actually kind of taking a back seat toward things. Um, you know, he saw, saw the logic in you know pushing his his younger stars, and he put himself down you know down on the the card normally, um, so they could have you know opportunities like this. Um, it's kind of sad that in a way, um, Isawa didn't really learn from this um, when he was in Noah. Because um, obviously, you know, with how it was, the the titles were only exclusively really for the, the seniors. Um, but Baba Baba saw it differently, and so for Misawa, this was this was a pretty big deal. Uh, continuing on into 1988, uh, on All Japan's first event of that year, uh, Masao would wrestle then AWA World Heavyweight Champion uh, Kurt Henning. Uh, he won by count up, but the title did not change hands, and this was kind of you know kind of controversial for the fans in Japan because like we said before like titles can change on a count up but obviously not the AWA world title cuz it's an american title but you know it, it, i i'm sure there was like kind of a an interesting dynamic there because you know earlier of course like Jumbo Suruta in the 80s was the AWA world champion and like kind of Kurt Henning would succeed him because he he would follow Nick Bockwinkle in that lineage it would be like Hansen then Hansen would give up the title Bockwinkle is the champion and then Kurt Henning would take the belt from uh you know so from from Bockwinkle and this, so kind of Henning is kind of like the AWA version of you know what what Masao is to all Japan Henning would be yeah. to to the AWA so it's kind of interesting to see like these two guys their past you know just collide in like this one, yeah. one off time but I still think that that's kind of interesting yeah um there's a lot of just all the like these you know stories to be told and just the way you know how things you know just worked out it is fascinating um because there's so much behind it and there's so much meaning in it um you know that just uh you know to to write about to look into to think about there's a lot there and on on march 8th 1989 he would have another really interesting match he would get a a shot at the NWA World Heavyweight title, then held by Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. Uh, of course, he would lose that that match. Uh, but also, like he would suffer like some serious uh, like injuries. He tore his left ACL uh, during the match, and he was inactive for the rest of 1989. Yeah, <laughs> this is when uh, we saw his sense of humor actually first of all came to to the fore. Um, because there are pictures of him, um, you know, obviously he's wearing the tiger mask in the hospital, in the hospital bed, um, his knee um, bandaged and everything. Uh, so Misawa used to make, you know, <laughs> make rude jokes about it. And I think that's partly because of what, you know, his his humour. And I think that was also partly because, as I said, he didn't like the gimmick and he wanted to, you know, that take a take a stab at, you know, tiger mask was just this good and pure guy because Misawa started saying that, you know... Did he read in the hospital? He said yes. He read rude books. I see. Yeah, so, so I think that was kind of Misawa's rebellion against against it. Well, what, what's what's Baba going to do? Fire him? No, I mean this guy's the future <laughs> of his company. So, so Misawa would be out for the rest of 1989, but he would come back early uh, in 1990. And on February 10th, he would wrestle for the first time inside the Tokyo Dome, not on an All Japan show. He would do it for a New Japan event because what would happen was that, you know, and New Japan was going to do a show, I think, with, was it with WCW? And things fell apart. So yeah. then, then president of New Japan, Seiji Sakaguchi, called Baba, and he said, come, please help me with this show, please, please. And and, and Baba agreed only if, on the condition that uh, he, no one no one could beat his wrestlers, and they couldn't yeah. be made to look bad. So yeah. it was uh, Misawa uh, teaming with Tenru. Was this the only time they ever teamed? Uh, I'm not really too sure. I think it may be one of the rare occasions that they did. Um, I know that obviously you have the whole, um, you know, Misawa versus, um, you know, Tenru Revolution. Um, but I, yeah, it must have been. 
Because I can't think of another instance when they might have done. I don't think they ever teamed. Yeah, I, I think they were yeah. on opposite sides in, in when yeah. Tenru would appear in Noah. Yeah. But, yeah. but uh, it's an interesting dynamic that they would take on the team of George Sakano and Riki Choshu. They would uh, win that match by count out. And like, it's, in front of a, like, a very impressive attendance, uh, it's listed as 53,000 people. But you never know. Back then, it could have been like, 40,000. They just said, you know, yeah. there's an extra 13,000 yeah. people in here, but we'll just, like, we'll just, you know, yeah. give it to them. Yeah. There's 53,000 people in this, uh, in this building for, to watch this match. And I'm sure it was a, it was a really good feeling for us. Oh my God. Like all these people came, you know, are here not to see me necessarily, but like I'm wrestling in front of this many people. It must've inspired him to like, I can achieve this again one day when I'm yeah. a big star. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, there was, you know, there was a lot in this era um, for him. You know, that I think that did that did boost him personally. Um, but by now, he was getting weary of you know people saying, "Oh, you know, Tiger Mask achieved this, Tiger Mask achieved that." Um, when actually, what he wanted was the people to say, "Well, that was Misawa who did that." You know, the, the man behind the mask, and of course, nobody knew it was Misawa. And if people are like listening to this and thinking, "My God, I got to see this t- this match where Tenru and Misawa team up take on George Sakano and Choshu," uh, <laughs> probably you won't be able to find this because, like, uh, because of like you know, television contracts, you know, yeah. they you know, All Japan's on different channel than you know than New Japan. This match was never aired, so no, I don't think you're. Writing. I don't think it exists on tape. No, no, and um, and also as well. Um, there was a chance that it could have, could have been, perhaps, um, but after the fallout with uh, Mrs. Barber, which we'll get to, um, there were reasons why why it wasn't. Uh, from here, Misawa would uh, team with Kenta Kobashi, and they would win the All Asia Tag Team titles from the Can Am Express, the team of uh, Dan Crawford and uh, Doug Furness. And four days later, after that, uh, Misawa would wrestle Bret Hart. To a time limit draw at the WWF New Japan Pro Wrestling and All Japan Pro Wrestling Super Show in the Dome, and and I've seen this match, Asami, and, and and when I saw this match, you know, I knew, you know, Masao was Tiger Mask and he was wrestling Bret Hart, and you yeah. can't imagine the anticipation I had, and then you can't even imagine the disappointment I felt after watching this match. Yeah, it's <laughs> let's say for example, it's not up there. It's, it's like oil and water. I I mean, I love Bret yeah. Hart. Like he's yeah. one of my favorite wrestlers of all time, and then I was so into Misawa, so I thought, oh my god, they're gonna have like, like an all Japan style match. Little did, yeah. did I realize at that age, like, no, Bret Hart would never work the all Japan style. It's it's not no. for him. Yeah. Uh, it's on paper. You'd think you think you know you look at it and you think, oh my gosh, this is gonna be awesome. You know, uh, this will be a great. You know, this will be a great technical match. Um, but it never actually works out that way because they kind of seem unsure of each other and one style clashes with the other and you do come away from it thinking, okay, well, it's, you know, could have been better. It, sadly, it just doesn't work. No, unfortunately. I still love both, though. You know, I still love Red Hart and I still love Misawa, but I, I'm i just, I, I don't think I'd ever revisit that match again. No, um, no. So, but things are looking up for Misawa because, you know, later in April, uh, Tenru would say, "Hey, Baba, I got a, I got this uh, deal with this uh, eyeglass company, and uh, yeah, I'm gonna go do something with them." And that turned out to be Super World Sports, and and Baba was like, "You can never come back to this company yeah. ever again. You yeah. you betrayed me." And so you know, he would also take uh, some like Tenru would take some other people with him. He would take uh, Fuyuki. He would take Yoshiaki Yatsu. He would take Asahara Hara. So he took a lot like some of the mid card with him including like yeah. you know Tenru's peer so like Bob was like in this quandary I only have Jumbo left as like my native the only native star because it was he's gonna build a company around Jumbo and then later on like I think Tenru was gonna be the guy after you know after Jumbo had kind of like winded down as he's reaching his mid-40s but that didn't happen. So, like, Baba... And this is probably the greatest thing that ever happened to All Japan because Baba was now forced to look at his younger wrestlers. And he thought, yeah. I need to elevate them. And who did he pick to be the the first guy he would really elevate? That was, of course, Mitsuhara Masawa. Yeah. Uh, Baba, by this time, um, had to take real stock of things because All Japan had had what was known as the first exodus. 
you know, Tenru was told to go and never come back, and he took a lot of uh, established stars with him. So Bob thought, okay, I'm going to have to start from scratch. What do I have? I have Misawa, you know, I have Jumbo, I have the up and coming Kawada, I have Kabashi, you know, I've got a lot of young boys in there. Now, what do I want to do? What he decided then, um, and this was basically the the essence um, of the four pillars, was that he wanted to have, you know, a roster, you know, just, you know, perhaps four guys in particular um, who were going to show the All Japan style. They were going to show the Japanese, you know, the Japanese way of wrestling. They were going to win matches by, you know, pinfall, not necessarily submission. There was going to be no foul play. There was going to be no, you know, no count outs. This was going to be, you know, just a fight and this is where it all came from um all japan's fight to survive because see now they were dealing with both new japan and this new promotion led by the incredibly popular um tenru barber had to take stock of things and think well okay i've got also as well things are changing here you know we've got the you know american wrestling is gaining popularity as other martial arts sports beginning you know i'm gonna have to start from scratch and reevaluate. <laughs> So one thing to note is that, you know, several years earlier, you know, like, you know, it was really, it was really popular in Japan and particularly in all Japan for like these, all these false finishes, all these like, you know, terrible finishes to happen, count outs, DQ, yeah. because no one wanted to lose and no one wanted to lose no, cleanly. No. So Baba, I, you know, the story is Baba, you know, like had some, you know, like they would do these matches with Tenru and, and, and Jumbo in the early history of the Triple Crown. And like the fans were getting angry at these non finishes. But yeah. also the other, the other aspect of it is like Baba saw the popularity of the UWFI and the shoot style and they were all clean finishes. And he's seeing yeah. them sell out the big venues in Tokyo and across Japan. He's like thinking, I got to do this. This is what I have to do. Like I yeah. want to, I'm going to institute clean finish, you yeah. know policy in my company and and to his benefit like he had this new crop of wrestlers that were gonna pick up from where like jumbo and tenru had started this trend and then they were gonna take it to a different level where like and then you know it's, it's part of the reason like all japan became one of the like the hotbed of in-ring you know action because you yeah. didn't get the stupid finishes that you get in in american wrestling or other parts of the world yeah. and things that were still happening to some extent in in new japan even at that time uh so you know it's kind of like this confluence of like you know like this perfect storm kind of hasami baba had the ability to actually look around and see what was happening he always said you know as a wrestler you have to listen to what your fans want you have to listen to what the crowd wants it's not a case of People will like what I will tell them to like. It's a case of, well, this is what people want to see. And if you can't connect with your fans, you know, if you can't connect as a wrestler with your fans, as a promoter, then what hope do you have? You're forcing something on people that they don't want. Um, and that was a lot of his philosophy. You know, time's changing. You have to change with it. But you also have to be able to read your audience. And what the audience wanted was, you know, this pure fight, which then they got out of out of all Japan. So then we move on to a, a very pivotal date for, for Misawa, May 14th, 1990. It's a tag match. He's teaming with Kawada, and they're taking on the soon-to-be-departed Yoshiaki Yatsu and Samson Fuyuki. Uh, and during this match, you know, Misawa tells Kawada, hey, take this thing off my head. Take this thing off my head. And yeah. then Kawada, yeah. and it's, a, it's a clip you see all the time with regards to Misawa. It's Kawada unmasking, taking like un, uh, untying the, 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 the strings at the back, and then Masawa takes it off and just whips it out of the ring. Like you can see, I'm done with this. And then he just starts going to town on yeah. Yatsu and Fuyuki. And yeah. this is like one of the, you know, like you know, the highlights of Masawa's career is to take that mask off finally. Yeah. That's like the the moment um I think Misawa was truly born, the moment the four pillars were born, the moment, you know, Japan turned that corner. And it ended into what people called, you know, the golden age, the golden era, the era, the four pillars of the Shiteno wrestling. That is when it really began. Um, Isawa said in an interview afterwards, he said, I could, he said, I took that stupid mask off and I could finally go back to being Misawa. So after this match, he, which he and Kawada won, he would then challenge his childhood hero, Jumbo Sarura to a singles yeah. match because he's ready to, you know, go to the next level in his career. So at this time, let, let's, let's talk briefly about what kind of relationship 
did Masawa have with Giant Baba? And what kind of relationship did he have with, you know, Jumbo Saruta? Because these are two guys who are, you know, like kind of, you know, his mentors. Um, All Japan was actually had a, after, you know, the seniors had departed and um, obviously leaving only perhaps Saruta, it began to take on a very kind of um, a feeling of a family. And it it attracted a lot of um, what I would call waste and strays. Uh, for example, if we look at, you know, Misawa's childhood, you know, his father was violent. He didn't see him after he was eight years old. Kabashi's father was absent. Um, I don't know about um, Kawada and Tawe seemed to have a happy enough um, childhood. Ogawa, um, his father was very harsh. Um, I think um, in Onita's case, his parents had divorced. And the barbers themselves couldn't have children um, because about they were scared that, you know, child would have barbers inherit barbers condition um, but it may also have been that he was perhaps i don't know infertile but for whatever reason um barber kind of became you know the father of the dojo and you know um, and makoto was you know the, the strict mom but it gave people a a very family atmosphere um it gave them uh it gave them the family that they didn't have when they were growing up they had the indulgent dad and they had you know the strict mom and I think that's what attracted a lot of those people to to all Japan. So it was a very kind of you know fatherly, fatherly atmosphere, family atmosphere there. Um, um, but his relationship um, with Baba um, was over the years. Baba discovered that he could actually grow to trust Misawa very much. And as Baba became you know more frail, um, much to perhaps you know Matoko's um, Matoko's um, disapproval. Um, Baba actually began to trust Misawa with more of the booking, um, with more of how the business ran. And at one point, they actually wanted to legally adopt him as Baba's heir, um, in which case he would have had to have changed his name um, to, you know, Mitsuharu Baba. Um, they approached it with uh, Misawa and he said, no, I, I don't like that idea at all. You know, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just not going to do it. Um, but after that, they always used to refer to him as, you know, like as Baba being, you know, his father who loved him. And it was a it was a very, very family, very paternal atmosphere. What about with uh, Masawa's relationship with Jumbo Saruta? Uh, Saruta, it was um, more of a kind of a master pupil um, relationship. I don't think you had that father element there. Um, but when um, Saruta died, um, Misawa was there at the airport um, to support the family and to you know, help bring um, Saruta's body um, um, back to Japan. Um, but after that, because um, obviously uh, we all know he died um, during, um, you know, due to um, issues caused by a, a failed organ transplant, um, Misawa by then um, with Noah... Um, he just he struck up a, an association they still have um, with the Japanese um, Organ Association um, with Misawa saying that, you know, no one ever again in Japan, you know, if I can support them in this, um, will ever want again for any kind of organ, any kind of transplant. And this is Noah still have um, association with the, the association um, today. Um, so it was a it was very much a case of I think with him. Um, a very strong bond of, you know, teacher and teacher and pupil. A lot of uh, mutual respect between the two because, you know, like, you know, Masao would do that for, you know, for the, uh, the create the association with the, the Organ Transplant Society of Japan as a way to honor Jumbo. But like Jumbo would really go to task for Masawa by, you know, supporting him to become the next president of all Japan yes. after, after uh, yeah. Baba dies. And yeah. this kind of like angers, Mrs. Bob, because like then Jumbo is kind of banished from the board directors without any severance pay. And I, I would assume that's a retaliation against him supporting Misawa instead of yeah. Mitsuo Momoda. Yeah, she could be. Um, she was a, she was a very complicated woman um, because I think as a little girl, um, she'd actually been very headstrong. She'd been very willful and she'd actually been very spoiled. Um, she fell in love with Baba um, when she was a teenager and her father didn't approve of the relationship at all. Um, but as ever, you know, Toko got her way. Um, and she wasn't much liked backstage, although she could was capable of extremely kind um, actions. Um, she was a very loving woman, especially towards Baba, whose, you know, gowns that she made herself and... 
um, she would arrange for you know the Gaijin wrestlers to you know to celebrate um, you know Thanksgiving. Um, but she could also be very unforgiving. Um, Kawada described her once as you know being like a water boiler. Um, she could just erupt in fury at, at any moment. Barber was also aware of her failings, and he'd actually asked um, referee Kyohei um, Wada uh, to stay um, in all Japan and you know support her because he knew that when he was gone, there was nothing that was going to hold back herself and Misawa, who'd never really gotten on, um, you know, and the all Japan that he would built, you know, was going to change. And he asked him to stay on. He said, "Well, I know her personality, you know, is can be harsh." He said, but it can't be that hard. There's going to be nobody that's going to stay and, you know, and look after her. Right. So going back to uh, Masao's career, so he's challenged Jumbo to this match, a singles match, but the, and the rest of the tour would then build up to this Masao sort of singles match. And, you know, the way they built it up is through a series of legendary six-man tag matches featuring Masawa, Kawada, um, Kanekobashi, and I think Tawa is still in this group, and and also uh, uh, Siyoshi Kikuchi, the Super Generation Army, and they're taking on the the you know Jumbo Suruta stable Suruta Gun, which at that time let me see, it's Jumbo, it's Masanobu Fuchi, it's the Great Kabuki, and one more person. I can't remember who the third person is. Like one of the mid Carter uh, older guys. Yeah. But, that yeah. dynamic would change later on with the addition of Tawe and, and it just made that whole feud go to another level because yeah. it was great that Jumbo took on Tawe as his new disciple because like Tawe, I think needed, I think he knew he was going to get lost being the fourth guy in a group yeah. of yeah. Masawa, Kawada and Kobashi. He knew he was yeah. going to be num- number four, like yeah. Kikuchi because he's a junior, he's going to be number five on the totem pole, <laughs> but, but being number four, isn't that great either, but he knew if he joined, if he joins Jumbo, He's going to be number two in that group, which is not yeah. a bad bad place to be in the All Japan roster. Yeah. Uh, Kabashi once summed up um, the you know the relation the dynamic between the four pillars as you know Misawa was obviously he was a leader. Uh, Kawada had this huge rivalry with um, Misawa because you know he was felt you know he he always felt inferior to him. Uh, Kabashi was kind of like you know in between them, stroke third. Um, for him, um, you know, he didn't have the background that they did. Um, so he always felt that he had to, you know, catch up, overtake, overcome. And then there was Tawei. He said that, you know, Tawei, lovely personality, but <laughs> he wasn't really interested in, you know, overcoming anybody or catching up or anything like that. He said, you know, Tawei, Tawei was Tawei. He was just laid back. He just, hey, I just want to wrestle. Oh, yeah. And even that, you know, you could never get him to train. Um, even when he joined All Japan, um, his, you know, his trainer in uh, he, from Sumo actually said, you know, Tawei is lovely. He said, but you'll never get him to train. Well, he, you know, <laughs> I, I will say this, this isn't as, as, a, as a tangent here. When I first started watching All Japan, I'm like, yeah, Masao, wow, Kobashi, whoa, Kawada, oh, man, that guy looks tough. Tawei, I don't yeah. get it. You know, it's not later. I I get a deeper appreciation for Tawei now, but at the time I was like, because I'm a, I kind of am a body guy. You know, like I I yeah. judge people, I judge wrestlers by their looks, and it's like, I don't, I don't, what is, why is he in this group? Why is he on all these <laughs> matches? But he is actually, regardless, he doesn't want to train. He's still an amazing wrestler, he, and then he is. He's Papa such a wants, great wrestler. <laughs> Papa once took everyone to the beach to train. Everyone turned up with their wrestling gear. Uh, it's Avatawe who turned up at the beach with sandals, and you know Baba said to him, "What is that? Where are your trainers?" And Tawe said, "Why would I bring trainers to the beach? Because he 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 didn't. It never occurred to him that he'd be ta- you know that they weren't going to do anything other than sunbathe. So he'd brought his sandals with him. <laughs> smart man, <laughs> smart man, yeah. smart man. Yeah. Uh, let, let's go to May twenty sixth, Asami, and this is a very very famous match." It's Jumbo Suruta, Suruta Gun taking on the Super Generation Army of Misawa, Kobashi, and Akira Tawe. And, and, and for the most part, Suruta's kind of like just being a dick to everyone oh. in this match, including like, like, like he's knocking off, he's like knocking off Kobashi and, and Tawe off the apron. But it's this one moment in the match that's really famous because he, he makes a mistake of like provoking Misawa by just tapping him on the shoulder. And, and what does Misawa do? Misawa goes mad. <laughs> Oh, his reaction is oh, 
something that you have to see to believe it, but it is worth seeing. So if if you listen to the previous episode that I did with JP Hulan, we covered the, the famous singles match between Jumbo and, and Masawa. And this we talked a bit about this match and, and this is the birth of the elbow. This is this yeah. you know, Masawa oh, yeah. basically knocks the shit out of Jumbo. He knocks him off the apron and 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 they and it gets this move over. This elbow is now the deadliest weapon in all Japan yep. for wrestling. And think about that. It's like this is a company that has you know like Jumbo's lariats. It has Stan Hansen's lariats. It's got Kobashi's chops. It's got Kawada's kicks. It's got Tawe like choke slamming everyone. But the deadliest thing in this company now because of Jumbo selling it and the the way Misawa you know executes the the, the elbow strike is this elbow. That's like covered in a black, you know, elbow band, elbow pad. But it's like, my God, you don't want to get hit with this thing. And it's it's the thing that's going to help him win a lot of his matches throughout yeah. the rest of his career. Yeah. It's just how Misawa does it as well, because it just comes out of nowhere. And uh, you just sink it and you think, well, well you know, just, just what, what did he do? <laughs> he just, you know, did that to wind you up. And this is your reaction. And, and from from this match, we then move on to, of course, June eighth, nineteen ninety. And like like I said before, Sammy, I mean, like the previous episodes, I went to really in depth on on this match. If you want to know more about like the the background of this match and the and uh, the review of the match itself, please listen to that episode. But just you know, briefly touch upon the background of like you know Baba's decision. This is the match where you know he decides Masao is going to pin Jumbo Saruta, and, and what you know like what prompted Baba to make that decision. I think by this time, you know, Baba wanted to shake things up. Um, He wanted to show that there was such a thing in his company, at least, where, you know, the younger generation, they could overcome the older generation and that the unthinkable, the impossible could happen. Um, I think, you know, fans were fans were begging for it. So he was just going to give them a a taste of, of what they wanted. And, and he would do that. He, you know, Masawa defeated, a jumbo in this legendary 24 minute match. And then this would start the trend of, you know, sellouts at the Budokan. Like, you know, the decision to push Misawa as the new up and coming ace. He's not there yet, but like people see like, okay, he's on his way. Baba's behind him. The company is behind him. He's not going to like create this new generation of guys. Cause like, I think also what people have to understand is like, it's not only Misawa that's getting elevated. It's Kawada, it's Kobashi, it's Tawe are getting elevated as well. And they're seeing like the dawn of like, then there's this group of fans who I'm sure started watching when they were kids and now they're, you know, teenagers or young adults. And they're seeing like, oh my God, I'm seeing people that are going to be my Jumbos, my Tenrus, my, yeah. you know, my Stan Hansen's, my Abdullah Butchers, my Masanobu Fuchis and stuff like that. And, and they're seeing it with the Super Generation Army, who would later become morph into the, the four pillars of of heaven. Yeah. And it's, I'm, I'm sure I got to think like I I kind of wish if I could if I had a time machine I would go back. This is one of the time periods I go back to. Just go to Corican Hall and Budokan Hall oh, yeah. all the time yeah. in, in the early '90s because like I'm yeah. sure it must have been for a wrestling fan the wild. most exciting period. Most exciting yeah. period. It was wild. It was a new thing. It was you know Barbara was introducing this you know this fight it was it was a you know it was a vicious fight but it was a fight it was one where you didn't think oh great yeah seconds are going to interfere again here we go with the chair it was nothing like that because although you know there was you didn't have that element which perhaps i don't know people in today's wrestling you know might find boring i don't know but what you know never ever made it boring was because that you could expect the unexpected you know you could see these crazy moves which weren't you know flips you know moonsaults or anything like that you know you could see the most vicious elbows you could see just how far their endurance was going to go and you knew that it was going to end with basically one guy just knocking out the other it was it was that yeah and it's it's just like and the like the adoption of like clean finishes in all japan you you were guaranteed a good match like you know yeah. if it might not be a long match but at least you weren't guaranteed like a dq or no, or, no. or you know double count or anything like that it was going to no, be a clean no. finish one way or the other which i think is is the most you know one of the more appealing things to see in a wrestling it match is. is a decisive winner and loser so yeah. from here from here we have uh you know masawa makes his first challenge for the vacant triple crown he's taking on uh stan hansen and the, the story behind this is that you know he was supposed to face terry gordy but 
Terry Gordy had the drug overdose, I believe, and then so he has to vacate the title. You know, he, Baba can't trust him in. <laughs> he got drunk and had a kind of a, a cardiac episode. Oh, okay. It was it was through alcohol. Okay, but I think yeah, he, he has a drunk episode late, later on. I think he'd been drinking and I think he'd be like in like in Shinjuku or somewhere. Um, but anyway, he'd had a, he'd been hospitalized because he let's say he he drank too much, so the the card had to be changed. So it's now Stan Hansen taking on Masawa, and and you know, you know, in Baba's eyes, Masawa's not ready for that title yet. So it's Hansen who becomes the new Triple Crown champion. Uh, Masawa then moves on to September first, and he's facing Jumbo again in a rematch. This time to determine the number one contender to the Triple Crown, and he would lose that match. Some people say, I don't know, like, let me ask your opinion. Some people like think this match, the September first match between Jumbo and Masawa, is better than the the uh, the earlier match. No, I don't think. I think they're I'm still on the same level because they've got the same hunger in it from Misawa, um, in the fact that you know he has to overcome, and I think you know by that time Saruta has you know learned a little more about this new Misawa, and he's ready for them. Um, that's what always gives the edge to to this match. Um, so it means that the next time they meet, Misawa is going to have to pull something pretty special out, and as we know, he does. Yes. Uh, and from from this point, um, Misawa is regularly teaming with Kawada. Like Kawada and him are the the regular like the A team of Super Generation Army, whereas Kobashi and Kikuchi are kind of like the B team. So you know Misawa is clear number one in the group, and Kawada is his number two. So they enter the uh, WSTDL and they make it uh, to the finals. Uh, on the final day, they, they make it to uh, a final match with uh, Jumbo Suruta and Akira Tawe, the Surigan team. And they place third in the overall standings of this tournament. So it's, it, it's an okay you know, it's, you know, result from Masao and Kawada here. But it's not like what they would you know, achieve later on in later years. Uh, and in a match against Tawe on January 26, 1991, this is the match that I referenced earlier. He wins the match against Tawe by using the Tiger Driver 91. So just for people who might not know what the Tiger Driver 91 is, is I mean, I'm just going to describe it quickly. So the regular Tiger Driver is you get a double underhook, like like you might do a butterfly suplex, but you, you lift the guy kind of in a, like almost like in a power bomb move, and then you drop the person flat on their back. The Tiger Driver 91 is similar to that, except you don't drop the person flat on their back. You drop them straight on their head. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and and God bless Tawe for taking this move the first time because he doesn't know. I'm sure he, you know, Masao's like, yeah, just tuck your head, just tuck yeah. your chin, it'll be okay. <laughs> you're oh, you're dropping on my head, yeah, just but just tuck, it's okay. We tuck our heads all the time. So you know the timing that like guys like Tawe, Kawada, and Kobashi have to have to hit. Like, and this is after wrestling maybe 25, 30 minutes of just beating the hell out of each other that they have to remember to make sure they tuck their heads so they don't break their necks with Masawa dropping them directly on their heads is kind of amazing actually yeah yeah there was a lot of um in all japan one of the things that they always used to put emphasis on um was neck training um because there is footage of kabashi training uh where basically somebody is standing on his neck and he's lifting his head um up and down I think that's like standard in all Japanese for wrestling dojos in in, in 2020. There, so I mean, yeah, train yeah. the neck. Um, <laughs> from from here, we we continue into '91 and uh, we go into the Champions Carnival, and uh, he enters uh, the 1991 edition of that tournament, and he places second in his block. Uh, he would then later challenge Jumbo Saruta for the Triple Crown on April 18th uh, in the main event of a sold out Budokan show. Uh, actually, this set an attendance record at the time, uh, but he lost to Jumbo again in singles competition for the triple crown so you know like baba's kind of really teasing this you know this this big win that you know that's what people want to see they want to see not only masao beat jumbo again but they want to see him win the triple crown from jumbo yeah and it's good booking on baba's part that he didn't actually make it happen straight away you know he was kind of carrot and stick um saying you know this is what you know you okay i know that you want to see this but you know let's let's play this out let's you know let's draw this out and it did it, you know, it would have been wasted had Misawa just, you know, won it perhaps first time simply because he was Misawa. It's good booking on Barbara's part to actually, you know, build those higher, higher levels until he felt fine. OK, yes, you know, anything more people are going to start losing interest. You know, here is the time to do it. And it told a very, very good story. 
because each kind of match they had, you could tell that, you know, that Misawa was going to have to go that extra mile if he wanted to overcome Saruta, because Saruta knew him so well. He trained him and he was, you know, he was he was ready for him. And, uh, you know, he's not doing so well in the singles competition in, in terms of like getting the triple crown. But on July 24th, 1991, him and Kawada would defeat the Miracle Violence Connection, the team of Dr. Dusty Williams and Bam Bam Terry Gordy for their first world tag team titles. And then they would make their first defense of those titles against uh, Jumbo Saruta and, and Akira Tawe at, on September 4th at the, the Budokan Hall. And, and this is where Misa- Misawa historically forces Jumbo to tap out to his yeah. face lock move. And that's, yeah. I think this is the, the move you're talking about referencing earlier. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because people were, you know, you, you, you very rarely saw that happened in that caliber of match in, in all Japan. Um, so people people couldn't believe it. Um, you know, even Saruta couldn't believe it. And there was a bit of, you know, like comedy backstage when Saruta said something like, oh, wait a minute, I tapped out. He said that, he said, did that really happen? I mean, we saw a joke, something like, well, yes, it's all on video, isn't it? You know, you can watch the footage if you want. It's, it, it did happen. Um, but it was a, a huge, you know, it was a huge deal. Um, it was... You know, it was kind of like, wow, you know, Misawa did what to who? Um, it was a, you know, it was a, it was a massive thing. Well, I mean, it's really, you know, goes to show like how unselfish Jumbo is. Like, first of all, he yeah. gets the, the elbow over by like, you know, practically being unconscious in the six man tag. And then he gets this face lock over by, by actually, you know, he, he taps to it. Like you can visibly yeah. see him tapping Masao's arm and that's where that signals yeah. for the referee to call for the bell. And like, people are like shocked. Oh my God, Jumbo submitted. Yeah. Yeah. To a- people, people couldn't believe it. I mean, if you watch the, the, you know, the crowd reaction, it's kind of like, you know, and it's, it's an uproar, you know, people, you, you very rarely saw this in, in all Japan, especially in those level of matches. And it was in, in its day, it was, it was very shocking. Uh, Misawa would continue his tag team with Kawada. They they would enter the uh, WSTDL again, and and uh, they lost to the Miracle Violence Connection on March fourth, nineteen ninety two, at the Budokan Hall. Uh, this had a record attendance at that time of sixteen thousand three hundred people. Uh, then Misawa. Oh, sorry, that would happen in the final. Sorry, March fourth, nineteen ninety two. Misawa unsuccessfully challenges. Stan Hansen again for the for the for the triple crown. Uh, he's it's still eluding him in the 1992 Champion Carnival. Uh, Masao finally reaches the finals of this tournament, and uh, but he has like this kind of uh, important date like uh, in his career on April 2nd before the finals. He he would wrestle Jumbo Saruta in what would be their final singles match as and it went to a 30 minute time limit draw, so there was no decisive winner. In this no. match, and this is the last time they would wrestle each other in a singles match. Um, I think that was kind of a good way to, you know, to cap it off, um, because you obviously, you know, to finish the story. Um, I think that was kind of like the perfect way to finish it, because by now they were on a level. Um, you know, Suruta was aware that, you know, of the levels Misawa would go to beat him, and Misawa was aware of the fact that, you know, Suruta, while he knew him very well, you know, he could still be very very wary you know of him because misawa had been able you know in the past to both to pin him and do the unthinkable to make him tap um i think just you know anything other than a draw would just have unbalanced it 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 would just have i think of just it just wouldn't have finished it and i think it would have left people wanting more for what they didn't have you know what they weren't going to get um but i think a draw was just a perfect way to to finish it because it showed as i'd said they were now on a level um misawa had come that far and Saruta, you know, was able to bow it against Misawa without, you know, either a final win or just, you know, a, a people wanting more or a defeat um, hanging over him. So I think I think the draw worked well. Right. Uh, like, obviously, you, you can work that kind of a draw, that kind of a finish in the Champions Carnival. And it doesn't yeah. hurt either guy, like you're saying. Yeah. But do you, do you think, but because this was their last ever singles match, because Jumbo would contract hepatitis he would have to mm-hmm. you know his days as the main eventer are over he, then he has yeah. to get you know he has to get the the, the organ transplant the liver yeah. transplant and he would die from compl- or is it kidney transplant yeah. he he would die from complications for that and yeah. some people would argue like in hindsight you know hindsight's 2020 obviously but some people would argue maybe baba should have done the the match where masawa beat jumbo for the triple crown obviously he doesn't know that these things are going to happen 
no. jumble through his career. Because I think if if he did, if he had that hindsight, if he was able to look in the future and then go back and rebook this, I think he would have had you know jumble put over Masao for the triple crown yeah. earlier. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that probably may have been um, perhaps you know what Barbara would have planned if things didn't turn out the way they were. Um, but I think for for what they were at the time, I think the draw the draw worked well. Um, obviously, no one could predict the future um, what would happen. Um, but I think just you know very very sadly you know with all of the, you know these I always think you know with all of these results, these matches, veterans putting the youngsters over, it was just very sadly something that Misawa seemed not to have picked up very much when in Noah. So, but he would win the, the triple crown in oh, 1992 yeah. on August 22nd, but he wouldn't do it from, from Jumbo. He would do it against, you know, kind of Jumbo's peer in, in the company, his, his equivalent, the Gaijin equivalent of Jumbo Suda, which would be Stan Hansen. And, and so like Stan's, Stan Hansen's the one who, you know, does the, the honors for Masawa and he puts him over and like, this is the start of like, you know, five legendary reigns that Masawa would have with this title. But what, what can you tell me about Masawa's relationship with Stan Hansen? Um, I don't think that they were, um, you know, particularly, I don't think, you know, they were particularly close to anything like that. Um, I think, you know, they enjoyed absolutely being rivals. Um, I don't really think they had a particularly close relationship. I think, you know, there was, I think, Stanson, Hans Stanson. Hansen was actually more involved with uh, Kabashi, as far as I know, um, than he was with um, Misawa. Um, but they were, yeah, that's, that's really all <laughs> I really know about it. Okay, that's fair enough. Um so then with the uh with him winning the title, he would have his first defense against uh you know, his tag team partner who would later become his greatest rival, Toshiaki Kawada, uh at Budokan Hall. Uh he he and Kawada would also win the 1992 WSTDL and they would defeat the team of uh, Akira Tawe and a young Jun Akiyama. I think he just debuted a several months earlier before this match, but it's like obviously like Baba saw something in him right away. Yeah. Uh, Akiyama had actually joined um, All Japan. Um, he was thinking about becoming a wrestler, but he also had a job in an office lined up. And this is a very typical Akiyama story. Um, he was on a train late at night and he saw a businessman slumped in his seat, fast asleep, um, drooling. And Akiyama looked at him and thought, there's no way I'm ending up like that. Um, so he actually joined. Um, so he joined All Japan. Um I there was something that happened, happened as it happened at his induction, um, but I think it was on the case that Barber took one look at him, and he knew that he was he was right for for all Japan. Uh, I think what he liked about Akiyama was the fact that Akiyama had a kind of um, uh, what Kabashi said that people said they used to think people used to think he was a little bit strange, um, but what Barber loved about um, Akiyama was his individuality, um, which I think won him over. I mean, like, you know, like it's, 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 uh, he, if you watch any of his interviews and, you know, like see him now, it's like, yeah, you can, you can see that in, in like Akiyama in, in 2020 for sure. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's interesting yeah. that it was uh, manifested early in his life at, at a, at a young age. Um, so we're now moving into like kind of like the, like kind of the, the next level of Masao's career. And this is like where he splits off with Toshiaki Kawada. Baba decides, okay, Jumbo's, Jumbo's sick. We can't push him as a main eventer. I need a new rival, main rival for, for Masawa, and that's going to be Toshiaki Kawada. So, you know, Kawada has a very grueling match with Akira Taiwe that goes to a time limit draw. They had been rivals in the Surtagun versus Super Generation Army, but, you know, in this match, they made peace with each other. They showed respect to each other. And from then on, Kawada would ally himself with the remnants of Surtagun and they and, and, and make a form of regular tag team with Akira Taiwe called the Holy Demon Army. By the way, one of the greatest team names in the history of professional wrestling oh, yeah. anywhere in the world. Yeah. Um, and they would feud with the remnants of the Super Generation Army, which now were, you know, Masawa Kobashi is his new second, and then Tsuyoshi Kikuchi. And then, you know, maybe some of the younger guys were, you know, kind of like their seconds and stuff like that. But that, that they, these guys were then feuding with, you know, the Holy Demon Army, which is, you know, Kawada, Tawe, and, uh, you know, a still active Masanobu Fuchi. So he's now shifted from being aligned with Jumbo to being aligned with Kawada, which is really interesting to see because these two would like go to war with each other in those 
Super Generation Army uh, Surita Gun matches. So it's, 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 I thought it was really brilliant that like the way to make you know Kawada Masao's rival is to break him off from Super Generation Army and feel like kind of like they felt betrayed that he's now teaming up with Tawei and Fuchi. Yeah, yeah. Baba was a, a very good booker um, because he was able to you know look at the whole picture. And kind of, you know, read what people wanted, uh, you know, read what the fans wanted, read what would keep them, you know, what what would keep them interested in the product that was now facing a lot of competition from, you know, a lot of rivals and a lot of outside sources, you know, and things that he had to that he had to build up as well. So it was a very, very good move. And it played on this natural rivalry between Misawa and, and Kawada. Uh, the other memorable event would be the 1993 Champion Carnival, and uh, Masawa again reached the finals, and and he would face Hansen again. And this time, uh, you know, he actually Hansen wins again. He defeats him yeah. for a second Carnival victory on yeah. April 21st in in Yokohama. So again, like you know, Baba's putting off not only him, you know, like you know, he he put off him winning the Triple Crown until recently. Now he's putting off him actually achieving the the champion carnival and a lot of other companies like in new japan you would win like for example the g1 climax and then you become the iwgp heavyweight champion yeah. Yeah. sometimes you have it the other way around you become the champion but like that oh that that tournament win is just i gotta get it but like you would del- delay the inevitable to, to make that that final victory so much sweeter yeah yeah and this is what barber was a master at you know at building things up of you know it didn't matter if, you know how long it took you know, and this guy's we're talking about, it was it was quite a few years. Um, you know, okay, everyone wants to see, try again. Everyone wants, okay, it's happening again. Will it happen this time? You know, it happens again. Let's have a look. And he, you know, he didn't, he bought it out when it was necessary. He saved it for special occasions. You know, it wasn't, you know, kind of a, a weekly thing or, or anything like that. You know, people tune in to see if, if it's going to happen this week. He saved it and thus he built it, you know, and it kept people, you know, saying, oh, I remember the last time, is it going to be? And that's because he, you know, he he knew he knew how to build things and how to, you know, not rush them. And this was a great, great, great build up. It kept happening, kept happening, kept happening. People kept waiting. They kept waiting. They kept waiting. And once again, <laughs> we were waiting for more. Yeah, it's delaying that inevitable. Like you're saying, Baba was like a master of booking things like yeah. that. And it's kind of like something that, you know, I think Masawa took into his own booking career. When he yeah. when he would form Pro Wrestling Noah, um, from here you know by by 1993, like Kobashi has now become Masao's tag team partner, and they would see a lot of success as a tag team. They would enter the tag league in 1993. They would defeat Kawada and Tawe in the finals, and uh, this is his. And they would also win the World Tag Team Championships in this match. And this is the first time that they would become tag team partners. Now, for me, my favorite tag team of Masao's in this period like he has four main ones it's the one with Kawada the one with uh, Kobashi the one with Akiyama and the one with Yoshinari Ogawa my favorite tag team with Masao was was with Kobashi because I think they complemented each other very well they did uh, Misawa had a hand in training Kobashi and again it goes back to um, this whole all Japan you know as, as a family thing um, because he was um, the senior student of Baba uh, Kobashi used to address him as a Nissan, which, as you know, means older brother. Um, so again, you know, they had this very kind of, you know, they had a rivalry, but underneath it, they had like this very kind of close relationship. And Kobashi used to say that whether they tagged or whether they had, you know, one of their famously brutal matches, Isawa was always open to listening, you know, what uh, Kobashi suggested, what Kobashi had to say. And he said that, you know, if Misawa hadn't, you know, done that, had he just brushed me off, had he not listened, then things would never have, there would never have been um, in any form a Kabashi and Misawa, um, you know, simply because they had that, that relationship, you know, out of the ring, Misawa thought it was very funny to get country boy Kabashi drunk. And, you know, Kabashi was never, you know, scared to play the occasional prank on Misawa or, or tease him. So I think they had this kind of, you know, this, this relationship that Misawa didn't have with, you know, with Kawada, it was one that, you know, that was no less intense, but this was just a very kind of, kind of different one. Right. Definitely. Like you can see more of um, a rivalry, but not so much hatred between Misawa and Kobashi as you did with Misawa and Kawada. But uh, we should, we should, uh, 
remind everyone that right now in this in 1993, Masawa is in the middle of his first Triple Crown reign. It's an epic one. It's the longest one in the Triple Crown's history at, at 705 days. And uh, as part of this legendary run, he would have a match with Kawada at Budokan on June 3rd. And uh, it was Kawada's third challenge for the title. And it would be the final successful defense of Masawa's first Triple Crown reign that, that lasted 705 days before losing it to Dr. Dusty Williams on July 28th in 1994. And it, it is one of these like things like, he he had like um you know he held this belt for about two years and just short of two years and like seven hundred and five days but he's also you know he's also holding the the world tag team titles he's he's like doing well in the carnival he he's doing well in the the tag league it, it's a busy busy time to be Mitsuhara Misawa in all Japan yeah and by this time as well um he was starting to take on additional backstage duties um because he was helping out Baba. And although he and uh, Mrs. Barber had actually never really gotten along, um, this is a time when uh, the seeds of the <clears throat> future resentment um, were sown um, because he was starting to help Barber with more and more. And she didn't really like it because she thought that, you know, what Barber had for his rights, you know, were being were being taken away. So this was really when the seeds were, were beginning to sow of you know, what was going to become the, the second exodus of, from all Japan. Right. So if moving, jumping into 1995, uh, Misawa enters the champion carnival that year, and, and he finally wins the carnival against Tawe on April 15th. He then would regain the Triple Crown, this time against uh, Stan Hansen. Uh, he ended uh, Hansen's fourth and final Triple Crown reign. So it's kind of like, you know, this is like Hansen's final passing of the torch uh, kind of a more definitive way to Misawa in some ways because it's the last time he would hold the Triple Crown himself. Yeah. Um, this was, you know, Stan, uh, Stanson. I keep calling him Stanson. <laughs> um, you know, this was kind of the kind of the big culmination of it. Uh, Misawa had reached that point where he was able to, you know, to defeat Hansen and, you know, overcome, you know, perhaps that final obstacle. Um, in you know, in all Japan, which then I think left him to deal with, you know, the rivalry with um, Kawada. There was the up and coming with uh, Kabashi. You know, it was kind of the the end of of that era, <laughs> that era almost. And then we moving we moved into June of 1995, specifically June 9th, when we see Masao and Kobashi taking on Kawada and Tawe for the World Tag Team Titles, and this is one of the greatest tag team matches in the history of this company. It's one of the greatest tag team matches in the history of Japanese wrestling. It's one of the greatest tag team matches in the history of professional wrestling anywhere in the world. It's also one of the greatest matches in the history of professional wrestling anywhere in the world. Um, It's a very significant match because uh, it's the first time Kawada gets a pinfall over Misawa in the rivalry, as well as the first time Misawa himself had lost a pinfall to anyone since losing the belt uh, to Steve Williams' Uh, you know, a couple of years earlier. And so, you know, it's like now it's kind of the signal that it's Kawada's time to ascend and, and join Misawa. Like he's just under Misawa, but he's not going to join Misawa on a similar level as him, as kind of maybe the co-ace of, of the company. Like th- That's the kind of feeling you get after watching this match and if you've been following their wa- rivalry for this entire time. Yeah, I mean, it was always said um, in, you know, the dynamic in the Four Pillars was was that uh, for Kawada and Misawa, it was always the case that the Kawada felt never, you know, he felt inadequate to Misawa and that he always had to catch up, he always had to overcome, he always had to, to prove himself um, against him. And you can really tell that in in this match, you know, the pinfall, you know, the near pins, the fight between them the vicious exchanges um it's all it all is really is illuminated here if you ever wanted to see you know just what things were like between them the rivalry the bitterness you know the fact that there was always always this kind of you know difficulty between them because of that this is a match that you want to watch if if you want to see it illustrated Jumping to 1996, we see Masawa and Kobashi kind of break up their partnership, and Masawa would adopt Jun Akiyama as his new regular tag team partner. So now it's kind of like Masawa is even more of a like kind of like the senpai 
to Jinaki Yama's yeah. Kohai. And I, and like this, again, this, again, this is another one of my favorite tag teams. I, I'm going to say like, I, and I love the team of Masao and Kawada, but, but I got to say it's like Kobashi, Akiyama, Kawada, and Ogawa in terms of my personal rankings of his tag team partners. But this, they had just a wonderful dynamic, these two as a tag team. Yeah, I mean, Akiyama, though he was obviously a different generation to them, um, you could never believe it. You'd always think that, you know, he'd joined All Japan at the same time as, you know, Misawa, Wakabashi, you know, Kawadi, Tawe, you know, even though they all joined at, you know, um, different times. Um, you'd always thought from you seeing him tag with Misawa that he'd been there from, from the start and Akiyama hadn't, which is why they always called him. He was kind of like the fifth one of the... <clears throat> of the four pillars. Um, oh, but, I, I, yeah, I always yeah, thought of him as like, yeah, I always thought of him as the unofficial fifth pillar, yeah, as well when I first yeah, started watching Akiyama, like his matches. Yeah, Akiyama fitted in, he fitted in that well from day one. It was just, it was just a natural thing. Um, but yeah, you, you don't, you, you could never believe when you found out that Akiyama hadn't been there from day one. What, you know, looking at these matches, he just fitted in just so well. And and like he would fit in so well with Masawa that they would win the World Tag Team titles from yeah. Kawada and Tawe on May 23rd. And a day later, uh, you know, Masawa would lose the, uh, the the Triple Crown to Akira Tawe, who had won the 1996 Champions Carnival. So kind of a, a very busy and eventful weekend for Masawa. He would win one championship <laughs> yeah. and, and lose the other one uh, yeah. the next day. Yeah. Um, it was a strange time in all Japan because it was kind of going through a an upheaval in a way, um, in the fact that, you know, Misawa, his dominance, it wasn't being diminished. Um, and but it was kind of being being changed in a way. Um, because there was a lot of you know what's the word I'm looking for? How how am I gonna describe it was being changed? He was kind of slipping into the Saruta role almost, um, in the fact that, you know, he was giving perhaps, you know, like Tawe a chance with the title and here was Akiyama so he was starting to, you know, enter that phase, phase of his career. Where he's kind of like, you know, the, you know, the old master that everyone yeah. has to knock off yeah. to reach that status as well. Yeah. yeah. You, 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 it, 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 it seems strange to say that like in like 96, you know, because it's, it's not, he's not that old and he's still no. like having really amazing matches. And I, yeah. I don't, I don't see like, I'm, of course I'm not watching it in real time. I think it'd be different. If I was watching it in real time, but you know, I'm watching it, and I'm watching a lot of this stuff out of order because I'm getting. I don't know which tapes to get. You know, they're not in chronological order that no, I'm seeing no. this stuff in. Yeah. So, like, I'd be watching something from 1999, and then I'm jumping to 1995, and I'm like, "What's the timeline of this? I'm not yeah. actually keeping track of this stuff." Yeah. But, but I can see if you're actually following the timeline of this, it's like I, I see what you're saying. Like, he's now slowly but surely morphing into becoming his for his generation's Jumbo Saruta. Yeah. Yes, you heard, you know, he's teaming with Agawa, and Agawa had a, a very late debut. Um, you know, he's teaming with Akiyama, who, you know, who, as we've said, has always seemingly been there. Um, so he was kind of entering entering that phase. So uh, he closes out 1996 with teaming with Akiyama in the Tag League, and they are defeated in the finals by Kawada and Tawe, with Kawada pinning Misawa in that match as well. So... At least in tag matches, Kawada is having a lot of success against Misawa. Um, J- January 20th, 1997. Uh, Misawa starts off uh, 1997 really hot. He defeats Kenta Kobashi at the Osaka Prefectural Gymnasium to win his third Triple Crown Championship. And so at this point, like Kobashi is really, you know, kind of on that level with Kawada as, as Misawa's main rivals. Like you can see that he has two. He has two main rivals, and not just not just like you know him and Kawada. It's him, Kawada, and Kobashi. And then you have guys like Steve Williams lurking about. You have people like Tawei lurking about as well, and uh, as well as like kind of Johnny Ace is kind of peeking in here and there in tag matches, mainly teaming with Kobashi. But you know he's he. It's really great because you see like Masawa having you know matches with different kinds of opponents. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of like by this time he of course himself was um very much in control um of a lot of what was going on in, in all Japan, which was uh, we'll get to was creating a lot of problems backstage. Um because Baba by this time was starting to you know, was starting to fade a little. And Misawa saw it, you know, as his chance almost in a way 
to to bring in you know to bring in to bring in new things um so a lot was a lot was starting to change at least you know perhaps not noticeably on the surface but if you look you can see the changes mm, I, I think you know if you if you have the kind of like background information that that you might have to me like yeah oh i can see what's happening backstage based on the finish of this match yeah. or the booking of this angle or this and that definitely um the Misawa would uh, continue. Let's see, where am I in my notes? Ah, he would enter the uh, 1997 Champion Carnival and reach the finals. It's a really interesting finals because this is like they do a thing where they have a three way tie between Kobashi and Kawada and Misawa. And so what happens is that, you know, Misawa and Kobashi um, are going to wrestle first against each other. They go to a time limit draw. Uh, Kawada had defeated Misawa in singles competition uh, right after, uh, and he beats him. And this is the first time he pins him, but he pins him in six minutes and nine seconds. So it's an interesting, you know, way to go about giving Kawada his first singles victory over yeah. Masao because it's kind of tainted because yeah. he'd already wrestled 30 minutes earlier against Kobashi. Yeah, there was a kind of a, and it's a sad thing to say, um, was that because obviously, you know, you had this rivalry between Misawa and Kawada. Um, but sometimes it could spill over into, you know, perhaps petty little things like this. And it, it did always seem to me that it was, you know, it was kind of petty in a way. You know, I thought that perhaps, you know, it would have been perhaps better for, you know, Kawada just to have gone on for maybe a little longer um, than, you know, than just six minutes. OK, it's a shock win. And, you know, it, things like that were starting to become in vogue in, in that kind of era. But still, it to me, it wasn't. There was some kind of malice to it. Yeah, you would think that then that that's your assumption that that uh, Masao was booking the carnival then then yeah. that particular match, not, yeah. not Baba. Ah, yeah. uh, yes. Well, that would make sense, I suppose, if if you really you know you know kind of become more aware of kind of like the real life like bitter rivalry that these two would have backstage. Um, continuing on with 1997, uh, we close off with, again, the, the 1997 Tag League. Misawa and Akema are in it. And they, again, they reach the finals and they again face the team of Toshiaki Kawada and Akira Tawe. And uh, they lose against the Holy Demon Army. And and at least in tag matches, you know, the a, the HDA in Kawada is, is very successful against, uh, you know, Misawa and whoever he's, teaming with uh we move into 1998 and january 26 is a very uh uh you know important date this is the debut of the emerald flosion that uh yeah. you know misawa uses to defeat Jun akiyama yeah uh misawa had um, actually got the idea um of a kind of an emerald waterfall um where you'd have like you know the water which was of his weight you know of, of crashing down um i don't exactly know what exactly he was inspired by by but that was you know his his inspiration his inspiration for it a kind of kind of heavyweight heavyweight waterfall well i mean it's a very effective looking move it's like yeah. I, w- I would i wouldn't want to be the the recipient no. of of any of his moves like and that's no. definitely one of them that I, like I'll, I'll take the tiger the regular tiger yeah. driver thank you very much <laughs> tiger suplex no problem Tiger Driver, anyone? No. Uh, Emerald Flosion? No, no, thank you. I think yeah. also by this time in, in all Japan, um, you had a very up and coming, you know, junior division. Um, Marafuji had joined. You had, you know, very young Morishima, um, Kanemaru, uh, Hashi, uh, you know. Um, so I think Misawa felt that he had himself to do something that was going to make him stand out against, you know, all these, all these young guys. So I think it, you know, it was a kind of a case of, well, you know, I, you know, I bought the elbow, I did the Tiger Driver. Now this is my, this is the new move in town. Yeah, he was very, uh, to me, he was like, him and Kobashi were the most innovative and in coming up with new yeah. finishers during this yeah. period. Kobashi, he, um, he wasn't as, um, he wasn't as imaginative as Misawa was, um, because he never actually had a move um, for the Burning Hammer, um, he, a name even. Um, the, you know, it was just a move that he did, but he never actually named it. Um, it was named um, by a, 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 a computer game magazine, and the name stuck. Uh, Kabashi never actually named it himself. Oh, maybe it's the video game I played. <laughs> it may well have been. Kabashi never knew where it came from, um, but whoever called it Burning Hammer, the name stuck. Um, but it just wasn't Kabashi that named it. 
an awesome name for a move. And it really fits that move, too. So whoever created that name, very it smart is. person. And Kabashi, after that, you know, said that, you know, burning was not just a name. It was a way of life. Well, yeah, I mean, that's one of my favorite factions is is burning, both in in uh, Noah and then later on with the team of, you know, Akiyama, Goshizaki, yeah. and you know Kotaro Suzuki, Atsushi Aoki, and and Yoshinobu Karma are going to all Japan yeah. after they left. All you know, Noah. That's getting on a tangent. Yeah. One of my favorite periods. One of my favorite factions. Anyways, let's go to the 1998 Champion Carnival. Masawa has is in it, but guess what? He has various neck and back injuries. He has a broken finger and a broken left kneecap. But despite this, and despite you know, his doctor saying, you should take, you should get some surgery. You should take like about mm, six weeks off. But so I was like, no, I'm going to enter the most grueling tag tournament yeah. in, in, in wrestling. Uh, you know, maybe the only thing close or maybe greater than that would be the G1 Climax over at New Japan. But still, being the champion carnival, doing all those matches, not fun. And But he would reach uh, the finals and uh, and he would win the champion carnival and he would do it against... Akiyama, and obviously at this point, it's like Akiyama is his Masawa. He's Jumbo. Yeah. Akiyama is is him, yeah. right? Akiyama is um, up and coming, and of course, you know Misawa is now finding himself in the position where he's the veteran, and he's now got all these all these young guys challenging him. Uh, very sadly, in terms of you know um, injuries, again, you know Misawa. You know, he was willing to put himself through that. Kabashi, you know, would put himself through, you know, similar things. Um, but they never actually let their juniors do it. Um, with them, they, they didn't. They didn't want them to grow up. You know how how they had. So they actually took a lot more care over them um, when it came to things like that. But for themselves, with the way they've been trained, with the way they've been taught by Baba, you know, they just they destroyed themselves. So from here, we move into May. Uh, specifically May 1st, 1998, uh, Giant Baba has booked the Tokyo Dome for a belated uh, 25th anniversary show for All Japan Pro Wrestling. Uh, the main event of the show is Toshiaki Kawada challenging Mitsuhara Masawa for the Triple Crown. And this is the match where Masai- Masawa finally drops the championship to Kawada. Um, he, Masawa went into the match. He had two blown knees, a bad neck, and a bad back. And he suffered a legitimate concussion during the match because he could not remember the finish afterwards. <laughs> uh, Baba, you know, Baba is like changing his stance on like, you know, showing weakness and, and, and letting people take time off. He, he announces that Masao would take a break to heal. And then, you know, Masao wouldn't come back to action until August 22nd of that year. But, you know, this is like where Masawa is like, yeah, he, 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 this, would you say this is the greatest match in the rivalry between Masao and Kawada? Yeah, I don't think anything um, they ever had after that would ever have, you know, have, had ever would have beaten this match. Um, as I you know, sometimes like to say, everything here just erupted. You know, all the frustration, all the rivalry, perhaps, you know, the relationship they had between them, just everything would just come out in this match. You know, the vicious elbows that, you know, Misawa threw which have been called in this match, you know, some of the vicious, most, you know, some of the worst ever thrown in a, a wrestling match. Um, but this was, this was the pinnacle. I, I would say so too. Like I, you, you get really that epic feel that this might be, you know, like there's so many great matches that involve Misawa in this time period, obviously, like against Jumbo, against, you know, Kobashi, Hanson, Tawe, and Akiyama. But to me, like, this is kind of like, you know, if you want, the apex of of Masawa, and you want the apex of Kawada, and you want the apex of them against each other. This is the match you yeah. you, you have to watch. Yeah. It's far more than just you know two guys who don't like each other having a match. If you take into account all of the history behind it, um, and then it it will it will take your breath away just what they accomplished in this. So I mentioned that he comes back in late August to work the the, the summer action series two tour. Um, you know, when asked, he, he's saying that, like, my knees are still bothering me. I only feel, like, about 60% healthy. But he felt he had to return because the, the two tours that he wasn't on had done terrible financially. Yeah. Uh, and they were two of the worst, you know, two two worst tours in, the, in, in all Japan's history. And this is kind of a problem that would plague him when he becomes the promoter and owner of NOAA because he yeah. can't – he feels he can't take time off because – 
he hasn't yeah. made enough stars yeah. in the company and yeah. business would fall without him even though yeah. he needs to take time off his yeah. his health is terrible he's gained yeah. so much weight and you know this is a contributing factor to uh, obviously a topic we'll talk yeah like later on in the end at the end of the episode which is his death but this is kind of like i guess one of the f- the first instances of him having this feel this pressure of like i can't take time off like yeah. it's I, I, this company can't afford not to have me. It's not an ego thing. It's, it's a matter of fact. It was a fact. And the fact was, was that, you know, Misawa kind of wound up being a victim um, of his own celebrity. Um, it's just the fact that, you know, he was this popular and that I think he wound up paying the ultimate price for it. Uh, sorry. Uh, you know, but at this time, he's also, he's gaining more, more influence in the back, as you're saying. Yeah. So, I mean, like, so he's basically, the booker of the company. Uh, and yeah. the only thing that Baba is still in charge of is Baba still books the triple crown programs and, and finishes. And he would do that through the end of the, of 98. But it, you know, it's reported that, you know, Masala was like, listen, I want to be the booker. It's my time. If you don't give it to me, I'm going to leave and form my own promotion. And you would think that most of the guys would leave with him. Yeah. Um, that was always the threat that I think Baba felt um, with Misawa, though he didn't really want to believe it. Um, but he did know that, you know, that was, even if he didn't want to admit it to himself, that was always in the back of his mind. Um, I don't think Misawa ever really kind of, you know, blackmailed into his face as if to say, you know, give my own way or else. Um, I think that everyone was aware of it, that, you know, if there was always this possibility, which we are, which we will see, was going to become reality. Well, it would, it would, you know, come true after Baba passes away. Yeah. I guess it would, might have been easier for Masawa to do it after Baba passed away than while Baba is yeah. is still yeah. alive. Um, continuing on, though, in, in uh, 1998 at the Budokan Hall, October 31st, Halloween, Masawa takes on Triple Crown champion Kenta Kobashi, and he would win the match to start his fourth Triple Crown. This match was rated... Match of the Year by Tokyo Sports, Nippon Sports, and the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. It's one of the, one of my favorite matches of, of Misawa's. It's like I think a, a perfect culmination of like the rivalry of Kobashi and Misawa. Like we talked about earlier with Kawada and Misawa, the Tokyo Dome. I thought this is like my favorite match between these two. It's a completely different atmosphere um, from uh, Kawada and Misawa because you get that element of you know of bitterness of hatred. Um, with this one, it's more of a case of, you know, the younger pupil trying to overcome the older pupil. And you get that kind of feeling of a, a struggle between them because Kabashi simply will not, will not go down. Um, before this match, actually, uh, Kabashi actually, because he knew what it was going to be like, they were going to, you know, they were going to beat the hell out of each other. Um, he actually rung his mother and said to her, if anything ever happens to me in this match, he said, please do not blame Misawa because he knew he knew what it was going to be like um, and what you know, what potentially could happen if they pushed it that far. Right. I, I, <laughs> I mean, they, they take each other to the limit. But again, it's not filled with hate. You know? No, no, or it's like a with... different atmosphere, a completely different atmosphere. It's, you know, it's not a case of, you know, Misawa winding Kawada up, um, but it's more of a case of Misawa pushing you know, Kabashi, because he wants to see just how far Kabashi is going to go, you know, just how far, you know, just how much Kabashi is going to take. Um, but Kabashi, Kabashi took it all. You know, he, he yeah. was not going to stay down no matter what. And there is a big what in that match. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, at this time, Masawa is, you know, now teaming with uh, Yoshinari Ogawa, a junior heavyweight in, in all Japan. But like, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, I like this team. I thought they were the most as a tag team because I think Ogawa is such a great wrestler and such a yes. student of wrestling, yeah. of like all kinds of wrestling. Because you can see a lot of kind of Southern tag team, American Southern tag team influences on their tag team. A lot yeah. of more double teams, yeah. coordinated attacks on with Ogawa as his partner, and and yeah, they would they would win the tag team titles several, a couple of times. They they would enter their first uh, tag league together in '98, but only place fifth. Um, but the the we want to move into 1999, Hisami. Uh, we want to go to January 22nd, and here Misawa loses the Triple Crown to Kawada in his first defense of his fourth reign. Uh, but the problem here is that, you know, Kawada is very, like, kind of um, cursed <laughs> with with winning the Triple Crown. 
because he has to vacate it the next day. And the reason why is because during the 20, January 22nd, 1999 match, you know, Kawada Masada wrestling, at some point, like about maybe seven, between seven and ten minutes into the match, Kawada delivers a spinning back fist to the back of Masada's head with such force, with such force that he broke his right forearm and wrist. Yes. Yeah. And, but Kawada being the person that he is, and this being, you know, All Japan Pro Wrestling, he would continue to wrestle for another, oh, I don't know, 17 to 20 minutes oh, yeah. with a broken arm. Yep. And the reason, and the reason you see, like, Kawada debut a new move called the Ganzo Bomb was it's a complete accident. Because he has a broken arm, he cannot get Masao up for a power bomb. So he has him in this awkward position where he's just kind of draping between Kawada's, like, you know, like, Kawada's yeah. holding him, but he can't get him up. But he's got him between his, like, knees, sort of. And then he just drops to his knees and drives Masao's head straight into the mat. And I think, is it, who is it? Is it Inoue who freaks out when he when he sees this match? He's in the corner. One yeah. of the guys in the corner just like, oh! <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, Inoue kind of almost, well, if you watch him, you think he's going to, he's going to, you know, he's going to just evaporate. Um, no one could actually believe what they'd seen. Um, and I think, um, and when, when things go like this in all Japan, it wasn't this match, but it was, a, it was, I think it was Misawa Kawada. Uh, Baba was actually moved to tears. Um, but they were so inventive, so inventive. You know, you're injured. They didn't stop the match. You just found way around, you just found ways around it. You, know, you this, would never, you would, you would never know that he broke his well, arm. There was one match, um, and it was a Misawa Kawada title match, uh, where Kawada had actually taken a load of suplexes in um, in sequence from Misawa, and he'd actually passed out. And if you watch the footage, you can see Kawada's out, Misawa drags into his feet, Kawada's got his eyes shut, he takes another suplex. Um, Kyohei Wada was actually ready to throw in the towel, um, because he was actually screaming, you know, you know stop, 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 um, because... You know, but they didn't. You just didn't do that. You just you kept on. Yeah, I mean, it, it's one thing. Like I have a passion for this this era for this style, but I even I recognize like you know it it is not something that people can do for a long time. No, it will I, no it Kawada, will have lasting yeah. effects that are so negative on your life. And it did. And, and Kawada himself used to say during the series, said so used to think, "How long am I going to be able to keep this up? This this is insane." Uh, but it, it was reported that, you know, at the conclusion of this match, like Giant Baba would say this is the greatest match he had ever seen in his life. Yeah. And this was the last match that Bob, Giant Baba would see at, yeah. because nine days later, he died of liver failure from uh, complications of colon cancer. Um, and this is where kind of the, the most tumultuous period of Mitsuharu Masawa's career backstage, at least. Would, would occur it's because now Motoko Baba has you know has inherited her husband's shares of the company and she wanted Mitsuo Momoda to become the president of of all Japan but you know Jumbo Suda said no it has to be Misawa he has earned it it was in Baba's will um Baba had actually left the presidency of all Japan to Misawa so because it was a late husband's wishes she couldn't actually contest it too much but she could make things very, very difficult for Misawa. Barbara knew that once he'd gone, um, there'd be nothing left, you know, there'd be nothing to stop them basically tearing into each other. And things got very, very petty um, between them. Um, Misawa wanted a desk. People looked at him as if he was mad. He took over Barbara's old office and he put a few pictures and trophies up of his own and he was told by Mrs. Barber not to, uh, you know, destroy Barbara's presence there completely. And she even got at him for what he wore one time. He actually turned up at a meeting wearing, you know, a, a smart, you know, it was, a, you know, it was a, well, he was wearing a shirt, but I think it was, you know, kind of like a coloured shirt. And she told him very primly that from now on, if he was going to attend meetings, she expected him to wear a white shirt. And he said, well, I don't see what the problem was. Everyone else was wearing, you know, coloured shirts, stone wash shirts, whatever. So things got very, very petty between them. Hmm. And this would culminate. We'll get to it in in, in a couple of minutes. It would culminate in like the the second exodus that you referred to yeah. earlier. But just taking a, a very quick look at 1999, uh, Masawa placed third in the in the Champion Carnival that year. 
he would defeat uh, Vader, who had just joined All Japan from the WWF. Uh, he defeated Vader for the Triple Crown Championship on May 2nd, in the main event of the Giant Baba Retirement Show. They didn't want to call it the Memorial Show. Um, and this would be his fifth and final reign as the Triple Crown Champion. Um, on May 7th, there's a press conference held to announce that Masao was the new president of All Japan for Wrestling. One month later, on June 11th, Masao successfully defends the Triple Crown against Kobashi at Budokan. Uh, this would win the uh, Wrestling Observer Match of the Year award, and this would be the second time these two would win um, this award. You know, the, the interesting about, thing about this match is Kobashi suffered a broken nose, and Masao was so fatigued that the, for the first time it said that reporters were not allowed to see him backstage. No. Uh, just continuing just continuing on, Misawa successfully defends the title against Kawada on July 23rd, defeating him with the <laughs> dreaded Tiger Driver 91. Um, Misawa and Ogawa continue their winning ways as a tag team. They win both the All-Asia and World Tag Team titles from the team of No Fear, which was Yoshihiro Takayama and Takao Omori on August 25th. And the interesting thing about that tag match, Asami, is that they 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 won that match. They wanted that match against No Fear because No Fear had kind of monopolized the tag team titles, both the All yeah. Asia tag titles and the World Tag Team titles, and they just wanted to, you know, get those both of those off of them. So they vacated the All Asia tag team titles, and Masawa booked a tournament to to uh, fill those titles, but they kept the World Tag Team titles for themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By this time, um, obviously, no Misawa was you know was the president of the company. He was the booker. Um, so he could pretty much do what he wanted, really. Um, obviously within reason, but things were 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 difficult at the stage. Uh, Misawa and Ogawa would lose those tag team titles to the team of Akiyama and Kobashi, burning great tag team name uh, on October twenty third in Nagoya, and then finally, uh, you know, again, like it seems like a pattern, like. Misawa gets the tag team titles, and then soon after, he loses the Triple Crown because on uh, October 30th, his fifth and final Triple Crown title reign would be, would be ended by the man he won the title off of, and that would be Vader. And then closing out 1999, the, real, the WSTDL, Misawa and Ogawa uh, achieved third place in the, uh, the tag league. And uh, we get to the end of Misawa's uh, All Japan career, February 7th, 2000, Masao was pinned by Junakiyama for the first time in singles competition during the same main event of that show. And that's one of my favorite uh, Junakiyama matches of all time. Yeah, um, this was kind of, I think if AP would allowed to, you know, if things have been different um, and he continued on in all Japan, I think we would probably have seen the rise of Akiyama um, in the way that Misawa had done. Um, I think that Misawa probably would have started taking perhaps maybe a bit more, you know, of a backseat, you know, um, done, you know, perhaps a bit more of the Saruta thing, you know, dealt with backstage issues, managed the company, um, overseen it. Um, and I think we would have seen the rise of Akiyama. Um, but obviously things, things didn't, things didn't pan out quite that way. No, I, I, I tend to think that based on like, you know, the, the, the TV I watched from then is that, you know, like his, his like new four pillars would have been like Akiyama, Mossman, Takayama, and Omori. That's the feeling yeah. I get because, like, yeah. they were pushed the heaviest to be, and like Akiyama and 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 Manuka Mossman were kind of tag team partners, and I I felt they would probably have gotten the tag team titles if the Exodus didn't happen. Yeah, and No Fear was like eventually going to break up. They were kind of like positioned as like the new Holy Demon Army. Yeah, company. they were going to be kind of like the you know this was the the late nineties, early two thousands. Uh, so they were going to be kind of like more of like the heels, more of like you know the, the bad boys in town. Um, I think that was the route they were gonna they were gonna go with them, especially, and they did also as well kind of um, kind of allude to that early on in Noah as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You can you can kind of see it in the booking, but we'll we'll never know for sure because yeah. obviously you know so like later on Masao leaves. Yeah. Um, just to finish things off with his his in ring career in all Japan, he he entered the 2000, 2000 champion carnival, uh, and he changed this format from Rod Robin to single elimination tournament. Uh, this is, was the first time this this format has been had been used for the champion carnival since nineteen seventy four, um, but this this you know this tournament was won by reigning Triple Crown champion, Kenta Kobashi. Uh, you know, he defeated Masao in the semifinals, and then he went on to finally win his first 
you know, champion carnival, and yeah. I guess only champion carnival after yeah. 10 consecutive appearances. Yeah, and then everything blew up and Kabashi left. But Kabashi himself yeah. couldn't believe it. You know, he said that he'd won this, <laughs> he'd won this tournament, and then a few months later, he had to vacate the title. So let's 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 go into the 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 Exodus. We'll we'll wrap things up with this part. Um, so let's we we you've been we kind of been touching upon the rivalry backstage between Motoko Baba and Misawa. What was what do you think was the the straw that broke the camel's back for both of them? Well, I think the straw that um, yeah, I think you know obviously when Baba died, the floodgates opened, and there was nothing now to stop her and him from you know attacking each other um but i think the straw that broke the camel's back was the fact that the humiliation of her having him removed by majority vote as the company president um akiyama not akiyama takiyama said that he knew that something um was up um even you know perhaps a few days before that because i think misawa probably did have an inkling of what was going to happen um because um, Misawa had actually gone and he'd asked people, um, you know, if I leave, um, would you come with me? I'm going to start a new promotion. I'd like you to be on board. He actually mentioned it to Takiyama over dinner. But Takiyama said that he actually knew that something was up because Misawa had been going around, you know, he'd been walking up and down the bus, he'd been talking to people. He'd, he'd been acting furtively, um, I think was the best way to put it. Uh, Takashi Sugiura said that Misawa actually approached him personally about it. Um, Marafuji said that you know he never told him he was just expected to you know just to, to go with his to go with his teacher which he would have had um, but I think the straw was just a final humiliation of you know Barbara's will being overturned and being basically you know thrown out of the company and being at you know, being at someone else's mercy so my question for you is you know at this point you know Motoko inherits uh, you know, 85% of all Japan's uh, shares. Yeah. And Nippon TV holds the other 15. So yeah. she has controlling interest of the company. Do you think that if Masawa was able to gain control of the majority of his shares in the company and then he would have all the, you know, the clout in the company, do you think he would have stayed with all Japan? Like if he could phase out Motoko Baba completely out of the company? Um, just give her like a stipend or something like that. And so she's still connected and Baba's widow is taken care of, but he had full control of the company financially and, and, and politically. Do you think he would have stayed or do you think he still would want to form his own legacy with Noah? No, I think he would have stayed. Um, because as, you know, as Matoka put it, um, Baba, you know, who is, you know, as she put it as, you know, Misawa, whose father loved him, she meant Baba. Um, I think he would have stayed at All Japan, and I think he would have stayed, you know, stayed true to you know Baba's memory and Baba's will. Um, but it got to a point where he just he just couldn't stay. Um, but I do think that he would have stayed with All Japan had things been different, or you know, had he had controlling share in the company, which meant that she couldn't touch him, he would have stayed. I mean, I I look at that if he if things were different, he had he had complete control of of All Japan that. What we saw what happened with Noah and like how the you know the, the the amazing you know especially with the juniors like it would be it would have been awesome to see New Japan finally have a junior scene that would have yeah. rivaled New yeah. Japan's yeah um and these emerging stars like he was in like I think if he was able to keep Kawada on his side if he could he could, if he could have stayed with all Japan or if he could have taken Kawada to to Noah. I think that would have helped things out tremendously because honestly, if you look at Kawada's career post Exodus, he gets in the best shape of his career and he, he has some injuries he has to deal with, but he's in pretty good shape, like physically compared to the, the other three. Yeah. Like, he's, yeah. He, he's, he's takes care of himself really well. And he has like some amazing, he has an amazing run with the trickle crown himself post Exodus. But you know, that, that is what it is. And then let's go on to like, he forms pro wrestling Noah um, and like, just give me like, you know, your, I don't know, three minute synopsis of like what you think was, you know, successful about, cause it was a very successful company for a period it of was, time. It was, uh, basically what happened was that, um, Misawa left all Japan and he formed Noah 
And Noah was to be an offshoot of what he couldn't do with All Japan, and it combined the teaching of the new trainees with the philosophy and the ideals of Baba, which is something that still remains um, to this day. Um, it's called, you know, Misawa style, stroke, you know, brackets, parentheses, whatever, Baba style. Um, the company was obviously based on what was remaining of the four pillars, um, Misawa in, in the lead, Kobashi, Akiyama, and obviously, you know, you had Takayama um, in the, the old days. But the problem was, was that while um, this was all well and good um, for about 2000 till 2009, what happened was, was that their, while their junior division thrived, their juniors were not going to remain juniors forever. And some of them became heavyweights. What very sadly I keep saying was that Misawa actually never actually ever took on board was something that his own seniors did for him um, was to perhaps to, to, you know, to step aside and try and create new stars. So what they found themselves in the position was, was that Misawa was the star. He couldn't retire. You know, he, he was perhaps thinking about it at the time of his death, um, but things just got worse and worse. You know, the Japanese economy took a dive. MMA was starting to become popular you know, and all sorts of different things happened. And they hadn't actually created anything, you know, there was no new heavyweights, there was no new blood, apart from perhaps, you know, Takeshi Rikio's, you know, run with the GHC that was being infused into it. Okay, you know, he gave it to Marafuji, but what should have happened was was that Marafuji should have overcome Misawa, except when their match came, Misawa took the belt back. So it came to the point where after Misawa died that Noah, in a very telling quote by Marafuji, was that we've lived too long on the credit of our seniors and now there's nothing left. And it has been a huge lesson that Noah Noah have learnt from because they've created new new younger stars with a veteran still there not to feel threatened by them but to kind of usher them along. So what Misawa's legacy has been to Noah, I think, is one of, you know, one of inspiration but I think also one of a warning, um, you know, be inspired by what he did, but, you know, but learn your lesson by the fact that, you know, what he didn't do. Right. I, I totally agree with you. Like watching Noah in real time uh, in the early 2000s, I'm like, oh, my God, you got you got Marfuji, you got Kenta. Yeah. They just need to put on some weight. They have but they have the, the personality for it. Yeah. You have. And not R- Rikio, I never saw anything in Rikio, but you had Takayama, who is becoming a big star in MMA. Hopefully, that could cross over. Morishima. Um, yeah, and that, that's the thing. You had Morishima. And if I think that they pulled the trigger on Morishima a little earlier, you could have got a lot more mileage out of the guy before like his, his health problems yeah. led to his personal problems. Yeah. And he's out of wrestling now. But like, and you could have had like, you know, some prime. Prime years out of Kenta as a heavyweight and Murafuji as a heavyweight before injuries caught up with those guys and yeah. before Kenta goes to ill fated run with the, the WWE. But it is what it is. Um, but yeah, and and let's let's end off on a sad note. Unfortunately, we have to talk about his Misawa's tragic death on yeah. June thirteenth, two thousand and nine. Yeah. He's he's teaming with G, uh, with Go Shizaki. Uh, they're challenging the GHC Tag Team Champions at the time, uh, Akitoshi Saito and Bison Smith. And it's in, uh, in this match that Misawa takes the, the back suplex from Saito, a, a move, one, of his, one of Saito's signature moves. But, you know, Misawa, for whatever reason, takes this move, a move that he'd taken many times from different people yeah. throughout his career. Yeah, He takes it the wrong way, and it, it causes uh, an injury to him that's a uh, basically, the cervical cord is is it's a cervical cord transection. So his first and second cervical vertebrae are severed. Yeah, um, he actually had a. It's thought that he also suffered a heart attack as well, um, which um, would be borne out by the fact that his face was turning blue as well. And he whispered, "There's something wrong. Stop the match." And those are his last words. Uh, the referee um, tried to do. Um, CPR, but it didn't work. And you know, when the paramedics arrived, they Misawa was sweating so much, the arena was so hot um, that everyone took off their t-shirts and they gave it to the the paramedics to to wipe the, the sweat away with. Um, but it was too late. There was nothing that could be done. Um, by that time, Misawa was in a terrible physical shape. 
Um, he had a high level of, I mean, I know there's this, you know, people saying, there is this rumour where people say, oh, well, you know, he didn't, you know, rely on any kind of medication. He relied solely on, you know, acupuncture. That's not true. Um, he was actually on a high level of painkillers. His physical condition by that time had ballooned. Um, he didn't have, you know, the shape that he had in, in all Japan. And after he died, it was said that they'd found um, home um, diet kits, um, you know, stuff that he'd mail ordered um, in his office, simply because he was in too much pain. He wasn't sleeping. He was drinking heavily. You know, he had to attend to being both an active wrestler, um, being in, you know, in the league and also, you know, and running Noah. Um, but one of the, the kind of things that Misawa did do um, for his juniors um, was to insist that when they were injured, that they take time off. There was no shame in going to the hospital. There was no shame in being injured. There was no shame in, in being operated on. Um, he didn't want them to end up, you know, as as he did, basically basically destroying himself. Yeah, you would, you would, you kind of wish, like maybe he he would take his own advice in that regard yeah. as well. The, the tragic um, thing was that around about the time when um, Misawa died was that he was actually starting to, you know, realise that if he built up Shiozaki, then, you know, obviously he'd throw into the mix Marafuji, he had Kenta, there was this this whole junior scene, which then, you know, this whole, you know, junior heavyweight, you know, by that I mean younger heavyweight scene, which he was actually starting to realise that perhaps, you know, he could now he could now build up, they could leave Noah, and he could now, he could now retire and, attend to the things that he he wanted to um but very sadly it was just too late yes unfortunately it's it's a tragic end to one of the you know one of the greatest in-ring performers of all time um i i learned something from like i i think it was your appearance on eastern lariat or it was it was something you wrote on your blog but mm. like he he had left a letter behind for he did or if he in the case of he if he died in the ring he did he um had a premonition um that that this is how it was going to end um he was going to die in the ring um so he wrote a letter and he entrusted it to one of his um one of his close friends basically saying to the wrestler who he lost his life against you know it's not your fault i want you to continue you know i'm i'm not angry with you um akitoshi saito who sadly um was the one that it happened to um whenever he's wrestled um whatever arena he's in whatever show he's on he has always kept that letter with him he's always kept he, he won't go he won't enter any kind of match, any kind of arena without it. It's it's a you know really selfless act in you know like for for him to do in you know with in the event that he thought he was going to die in the ring and yeah. then he wanted to make sure that the person he was in the ring with didn't blame themselves for it. Yeah. All right. On that note, let's let's wrap things up. I'm going to do a quick uh, uh, kind of. Um, accounting of, of of his title history so starting with all japan for wrestling he he won the all asia tag team championship twice once with kenta kobashi once with yoshinari gawa he was a triple crown champion five times he was the world tag team champion six times uh with toshiaki kawada kenta kobashi jun akiyama and yoshinari ogawa he was the nwa international junior heavyweight champion one time as tiger mask he was the PWF World Tag Team Champion one time with Jumbo Sutra as Tiger Mask. He had won the Champion Carnival twice in 1995 and 1998. He had won, he'd won the Tag League four times in 1992, 1993, 1994, and 1995. Once with Toshiaki Kawada and the remaining three times with Kenta Kobashi. In Pro Wrestling Noah, he was the GHC Heavyweight Championship uh, champion three times. He was a tag team champions twice, both with Yoshinari Gawa, and he won the Global Tag League one time in 2009 with Go Shizaki. And the 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 awards he had won from different publications are too too numerous to mention. Just just go check out like your work, Kasami. I'm sure you have a list of it. Check out his <laughs> Wikipedia. Check out like you know different articles out there. Um, I do recommend like uh, Dave Melcher's obituary. On Masawa in in the Wrestling Observer newsletter, it's it's a really interesting, fascinating read, really in depth as well. Um, but yeah, Hisami, any final notes on Masawa before we we wrap things up? Uh, yeah, I mean, I just like to say that I think Misawa's life is both an inspiration and it's a warning. Um, it's an inspiration as to what you can achieve, um, no matter what background you know you come from, no matter your your start in life. 
Um, but I think it's also a warning um, to perhaps, you know, learn, um, you know, perhaps the lessons that, you know, that people gave to you, you know, what other people have done for you to do it to others. And also perhaps the fact that in the end, you know, at the end, you know, you can give as much as you want for something, but your life you shouldn't have to give. So I think his tale is both an inspiration and it's a warning. Definitely. And and with those words, let's wrap it up here. Isami, thank you so much for joining me here on the long and winding Royal Road oh, talking about the, the great the great Mitsuhara Masawa. I, I learned so much. I did a lot of research for this, but I learned so much just listening to you oh, talk you. about him again. And uh, where can people find more of your work? They want to, if they were inspired by, my God, like I need to learn more about <laughs> Noah and, and Misawa and, you know, Kobashi and all of them. Um, if it's Noah you want, um, then you can follow my Twitter. I'm on HI5AME. Um, but if it's, you're interested in Misawa's or Japan era, and this also includes um, the history of uh, Barbara as well. Then the best place for you to follow me um, would be on one of my sub Twitter accounts, and this one is dedicated to the four pillars: uh, Misawa, um, Tawe, uh, Kabashi, um, uh, Kawada. Um, you can find this one at. Um, let me just bring it up. It's the four pillars of wrestling, and it's the four pillars one. And this is basically um, history, um, tidbits, you know, stories about the four pillars and about Baba. I am perhaps thinking of creating one for Ricky Dozan as well, um, because, you know, that's uh, started to interest me, this whole history and background of Puro, which I think gets forgotten and gets lost. But, yep, those are my two accounts where you can find out um, more about Noah or more about um, the, the four pillars and Baba as well. Wait, wait, that's your account? That's your other account? Yep. I didn't know this. Pillars of Wrestling, four pillars, one is me. I love that account. So I love both your accounts. Oh, your you. Nolan and your Farfellers. Thank you. <laughs> See, I learn everything. I, I learn things even at the end of this podcast. But <laughs> Sami, again, thank you very much. Please check her out on Twitter. Check her blog out as well. Um, on behalf of Sami, I want to thank all the listeners for sticking with us. It's, it's been like almost two hours we talked about Masawa. I hope people learned a lot. I know I did. I learned a lot of new things. And uh, until next time, I will say on behalf of Sami... Uh, goodbye until the next episode. <laughs>